thank you for doing all that. I'm going to get us started while we're all still gathering. Since we're running late, we started executive session early, but we still have a lot to, a lot to discuss. And I apologize for our late start today. Uh, tenemos servicios de interpretación disponibles. Por favor, si indica con la mesa aquí si se necesita servicios de interpretación. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 23rd. May 23rd is World Turtle Day and National Lucky Penny Day. Keep looking. You still have a few hours to find that lucky penny uh, for yourself. And on this day, uh, in 1785, Benjamin Franklin announced his invention of the bifocal eyeglasses. And I won't ask anyone on this dais if anybody's wearing bifocals or needs bifocals. No, either anybody in the audience here tonight. I'm sure some of you do nearly 250 years later. Uh, so I'm going to get started here with our roll call. Ms. Pena, floor is yours. Ms. Extra? Here. Ms. Luna Rose? Here. Mr. Romero? Here. Here. Ms. Shaw? Here. Dr. Robbie. Here. All right, we're going to get moving on with our land acknowledgement statement. And we have someone uh, looks like on Zoom here. And is that Miracle Pettigrew? Hi, Miracle. Miracle is an 11th grader at Catalina High School. She's a junior. She identifies as Tona Odom and Nahavaho. Miracle is a family from San, uh, San, San Xavier District and the San Juan community on the Tona Odom and Navajo reservations. Her hobbies include playing volleyball and listening to music. She plans to be a lifeguard over the summer. Miracle will be among other Native American students recognized during Native American Services annual recognition for having an outstanding 3.7 unweighted GPA her junior year. Congratulations, great job. For her senior year, uh, Miracle plans to apply to Grand Canyon University and Northern Arizona University to study psychology. Great, we need more psychologists and people working on mental health in our community. I hope you come back to Tucson when you are done. Um, Ms. Bettigrew, the floor is yours for our land acknowledgement statement. Great, thank you, Ms. Pettigrew, and good luck uh, this summer and in your last year as a TUSD student. Uh, okay. Great. And for a Pledge of Allegiance, unfortunately, our student uh, isn't available anymore. So I'm going to just ask everyone to rise. One, two, three. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and before I turn over to Dr. Trujillo for agenda adjustments, I love seeing the sea of red. Thank you, everyone who's here, uh, many of our teachers and educators from around the district uh, for being here tonight. Look forward to, um, to working with you and hearing uh, a lot from you this evening. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, we have agenda adjustments. Uh, members of the governing board, uh, we have two agenda adjustments for consideration. We'd like to request that items 9.2 and 9.1 in that order uh, follow the call to the audience. All right. Is there any objection? I'm seeing none. I'll take that as unanimous with consent to follow our call to the audience with 9.2, then 9.1. Then we'll be going on to our consent agenda and the rest of our agenda for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. And the floor remains yours for awards and recognitions. Yes, uh, President Shaw, uh, members of the governing board, uh, Tucson Unified Community, welcome to our uh, final meeting in May, and welcome all of you uh, logging in online to watching our governing board do the people's business. 
Our favorite portion of each governing board meeting, of course, is awards and recognitions. We have a short but very, very uh, wonderful awards and recognitions tonight. I want to start by welcoming a friend and colleague, former officer of Arizona School Boards Association and currently representing the Arizona Border Regents here, Monica Trejo. She is here to recognize University High School for their excellence in uh, FAFSA completion. That is the free application for financial aid. A tremendously overwhelming uh, majority of their students on campus completed the free application for financial aid. And here to receive the reward for University High School is its principal, Mr. Alberto Rangel. Thank you. Good evening, President Shaw, members of the Governing Board, and Superintendent Trajillo. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly speak. As mentioned, my name is Monica Trejo, and I am the board, uh, Director of Community Engagement for Arizona Board of Regents and also a former TUSC student. So I'm really excited to be here today on behalf of the Board of Regents, as Dr. Trujillo mentioned, to celebrate one of your schools for our FAFSA challenge. Um, the free application for federal student aid is the form um, students need to fill out in order to receive financial aid from the federal government for college, as you may know. Nationally, the high school class of 2022 left an estimated of $3.58 billion on the table in the form of unclaimed Pell Grants. Completing the FAFSA is one of the best predictors of post-secondary enrollment, with 84% more likely to immediately enroll in post-secondary education. Arizona currently ranks 49th nationally uh, in terms of FAFSA completion, and as of April 14th, 34% of high school seniors completed the FAFSA statewide. Thanks to efforts like yours here at TUSD, Arizona saw a 5% increase from the previous year. Uh, today, I am here to celebrate our FAFSA Challenge winners, um, who are leaders in the state university high school with 77% completion rate. As of April 2nd, um, they have received three brand new laptops and awarded to the graduating seniors of their choice who have completed the FAFSA. I want to thank and highlight the work of Principal Rangel, the staff, and the college career specialist, Megan Palos, who has done a fantastic job in leading these efforts. And I also want to say Pueblo is gunning for next year's challenge right. winner for the FAFSA. Um, so congratulations to University High School and to USD. Congratulations again, University High School. Thank you, Arizona Board of Regents, for that wonderful recognition. And now, uh, moving on with our awards and recognitions, it never gets old coming to a board meeting and announcing another state championship for the Lady Sabercat softball team in their latest championship run. The Sabino, the Lady, the Lady, Sa the Lady Sabercat softball team found themselves in a thrilling showdown against Empire High School in the softball state championship game. The game was unfortunately halted temporarily when heavy rain poured down um, earlier that week. But um, after the suspension of the game, when the teams got back together, uh, it was Sabino that prevailed, where the Lady Sabercats took home their fourth straight state championship with a victory over Empire High School, back to back to back to back. Congratulations, Sabino Sabercats. We will have them here in person uh, as the first order of business when school reconvenes in August. Our Sabercats are enjoying the end of the year. Several have uh, commitments. Several also uh, participate in the performance arts or involved in several different performances, so we couldn't get the entire team here. But we will do so when they come back uh, in August, and they'll be able to show off that fourth consecutive trophy. So let's give the Lady Sabercats a round of applause for champs. The Tucson Unified School District is home to one of the largest populations of CTE course taking students uh, with over 7,000 students enrolled in career and technical education programs across the district. There is no shortage of stories of excellence for our students in career and technical education programs here in TUSD. So let's go ahead and honor some of these wonderful students and the educators that support them. Let's start with uh, Santa Rita and University High School. Congratulations, Brenda Lunt, sponsored teacher at the uh, Santa Rita uh, HOSA chapter for winning the Future Health Professionals of America HOSA State Leadership Silver Chapter Award. Santa Rita, Santa Rita also had six students who won various state uh, conference leadership awards. Congratulations, Temple Dees 
Avery Arias, Barbara Hartman, Nevea Ramirez, Siriana Coronado. Also, congratulations to Robert Wells and Temple Dees, who won third place at the Sarset Fair for their microbiology project. Uh, switching it over to UHS, congratulations sponsored teacher David Herring uh, for the Future Business Leadership of America Incorporated High School Division. Six students won FBLA awards at the state conference. Congratulations Jackie No, Nathan Scheinbein, Jack Nolan, Kian Sadat, Trey Harrison, and Katek Zaretta for their uh, outstanding accomplishments at the state conference. Looking at CTX, CTE excellence over at Choya, I want to congratulate sponsor teacher Gloria Nelson for Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. That's FCCLA. They had three students win awards at the State uh, Family, Career, Community Leaders of America Conference. Congratulations to Miranda Badia Guerrero, Ariet Cruz Martinez, and Alexia Ortiz. And over at Saguaro, let us congratulate sponsored teacher Monica Pida, who had two students receive special awards. Congratulations to Miles McAllister, winner of the Lanny Williams Scholarship from the Arizona Athletic Trainers Association. Kylie Schlack, recipient of the Banner Hospital Perry Initiative, which is a one-day career exploration for young women interested in orthopedic surgery or engineering. And rounding out our report on CTE excellence is Badger Nation, Tucson Magnet High School. Congratulations to Mallory Scheib and James Borland of Tucson Magnet High School, students from, uh, students from, C from Tucson High's digital photography program averaged 81% scoring on the CTE Spring Technical Skill Assessment. That was the highest percentage in the state out of 84 participating schools, yes. Give them a round of applause. We have our outstanding CTE students in the house this evening. If you are here, can you please come up to the front lineup so our media team can take a nice picture? Come on up. All of our wonderful CTE students, give them a round of applause. Uh, President Shaw, members of the governing board, that concludes uh, awards and recognitions. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, and a big, again, shout out to our students, and you really do make us proud to be TUSD, so thank you for all your hard work to make us a stronger district. Uh, next on our agenda, 4.1, board member activity reports, and so excited to be part of a group of individuals and colleagues that uh, spend so much time uh, really visiting our schools and, and being part of our district, not just as parents, but as, as governing board members and, and individuals really trying to understand and listen to our district. So I will turn over to my board members for any board member activity reports this month. Ms. Luna Rose, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Sean. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know this is a busy time of the year with school just ending on Thursday, so we really appreciate your time here to let us, to hear us and let us hear from you this evening. But before we get to that, um, as Dr. Shaw said, um, well, this is a busy time of year, and I think a lot of us have received invitations and toured schools and gone to events, so um, bear with me. I've got a little list here. Um, I took tours of Kelland Elementary, uh, thanks to Principal Angela Schiavone. Um, what a, uh, all our schools are, are wonderful and beautiful, and, um, but I had a, a lot of fun that day and met their new chicks, um, milks, uh, milkshake and brownie 
and I and I can't remember the other one's name, but they're very cute. Um, and the kids asked me to say it in person because they knew I was going to come back and talk about it at a board meeting. So um, hopefully they're hopefully they're listening. Took a tour of Henry Elementary. Thank you to Principal Thomas Heminger for his time. Um, got to sit in with a couple of uh, reading specialists and sit in with some students for a little bit, and they taught me how to read better. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, tour of Miles, thank you to Principal Andrea Steele and our Assistant Superintendent Richard Sanchez for also um, being there with me. Um, if you're not familiar with Miles, it's a, a school that's got the highest amount of students um, who are deaf or of hard of hearing. And um, the students there, if they're, even if they're not deaf, they learn how to, um, they learn ASL, American Sign Language. So it's a, it's a wonderful program and I was really happy to be there. Same day, um, Mr. Sanchez and I also took Innovation Tech. Um, what a, just, I don't wanna be cliche, but what innovative high school. It's a really wonderful program, wonderful CTE programs. We were just talking, uh, Dr. Trio was just talking about it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, what comes next for them as they're, they're growing by leaps and bounds. Um, and I took a tour of Holiday, finally. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Strozer, for finally getting me there. Um, I went uh, to give awards to the best readers of kindergarten through second grade, and then they had a, a party and an obstacle course, uh, and they gave me EGs, so I was very excited. <laughs> and a um, couple other things. Uh, I attended both the Mexican American Student Services Recognition Program as well as the Native American Student Service Recognition Program. And if you have not had a chance to go to either of those programs, both of those departments do a wonderful job in putting it together to honor the, uh, those students. Um, and um, I probably shook close to probably a thousand hands over um, the course of those two events. I had my hand sanitizer with me, so don't worry. And, um, but it's, it's just lovely, and both of the departments do a wonderful job every year. Um, so I, I highly encourage you to do, if you have a chance to go next year, um, please do so. Uh, also attended uh, Rincon's Arts Under the Stars this past Saturday night, and it was um, exactly what it, what it sounds like. There was a, a lovely food truck by Special Eats, um, band, orchestra, uh, the choir, drama kids, they all gave little performances and um, within a two and a half hour time frame, it was a really loved evening. Saturday night was very nice. So it was kind of rivaled um, Tucson Pops, but I thought it was a little better. <laughs> so, and um, lastly, I did attend the Tucson High Drag Show and I just wanted to give a shout out to the students who put that together. It was a fun event um, and they were really um, excited to be there, and um, thanks to Ms. Rivera and her staff for allowing us to attend. We want to have another um, board member report into July. You want to talk about which uh, graduations you'll be attending this week? Oh. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, I will be attending Mary Meredith, which is actually just right behind here. Um, the program for a lot of our special um, students with disabilities program. Uh, and I do believe I'm attending that from Ms. Ekstrom. And um, tomorrow night is Palo Verde High School and Thursday night, Choi High School. Great. Ms. Shaw, please go ahead. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. Um, let's see. So uh, over the last few weeks, I, I also attended the Tucson High School Drag Show. Uh, lovely job there to all the students and the staff who put in work. Uh, let's see, I also visited Warren Elementary uh, for their Special Olympics, um, all of the events and then the ceremony after. It was lovely, uh, me and uh, Mr. Romero were there um, and it was such a tremendous effort by um, the whole school community um, to put on um, that uh, event and it was fabulous. Um, 
Next, I was invited by uh, Ms. Sotelo to um, appear at Catalina's uh, culturally relevant curriculum class uh, with Ms. Fierro um, to talk with the students about some of the work that they're doing in the class and also some of my work um, in the community and on the governing board and you know how to um, you know make change. They had a lot of questions, interesting questions. Some of them asked me, how old are you? And I told them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was important though for them to see that you know you don't have to look a certain way or be a certain age to uh, try out leadership positions. Um, and so uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sotelo, for inviting me to that class. Um, I also attended the TEA Code of Conduct forums uh, where me and uh, Dr. Ravi got to hear um, the uh, members' concerns um, uh, in regards to the Code of Conduct, um, some of their suggestions, recommendations, and just things that they've experienced day to day um, at our schools. Uh, let's see, and I sp had some private conversations with staff members and uh, one parent about issues that they're facing and directed them to some resources. Um, but uh, last night I, I wrote a letter of recommendation for a school that's looking to um, uh, get a grant funding for their library. Um, and yeah, that was really great. Uh, so yeah, uh, schools definitely keep an eye out for uh, grant opportunities, that there's money everywhere. And so um, I'm always down to provide a letter of recommendation if it's needed. Uh, and I'll be at, um, tomorrow I'll be at the Tucson High School for their graduation ceremony. Looking forward to it, my cousin will be graduating. Um, and then I'll also be at Catalina on um, Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Ms. Ekstrom, Mr. Romero. All right, Ms. Ekstrom. Hi, thank you. Uh, this May was a cut a little short. I had a stress fracture in my foot, so I was very disappointed that I had to cancel a couple of tours, but looking forward to coming back in September to those schools. But I did attend the Tucson Hydrax show. Thank you to all of the students, teachers, staff, and organizers for putting together a wonderful event. I was able to visit Holiday Fine Arts Magnet School. Thank you to Dr. Strozier for the incredible tour. And in that school, they showcase art in every part of that school. It's just amazing and magnificent. Um, if you've never been there and you're looking for uh, an elementary school, I highly recommend touring that. Next, I visited Safford K through eight. It was amazing to walk the halls that my mom did uh, she was so uh, proud to have attended Safford, so I was so glad to be there. I also got to visit with Higher Ground and see the amazing work that they are doing out at Safford. So thank you to Principal Dr. Kuhn, uh, Vice Principal Peebles, and Dean of Students, Mr. Patrick, for the conversation and tour. I also was able to attend Ochoa's Community School's 100-year celebration. They had food, music, a silent auction, entertainment, they also did a timeline of the school's 100 years, and I am thankful for the years that the community worked to keep that school from closing. That was one of the most important causes that I worked on as mayor of the city of South Tucson. So here's to another 100 years, Ochoa. Next, I made a visit to Warren Elementary School where I got to see the students' OMA art installation in their library. Thank you to Principal Rosman for inviting me to see all of the amazing work created under the OMA teacher, Joshua Floyd. Each class, pre-K through fifth grade, worked on projects all year, and those were showcased um, throughout the library. And those works of art were inspired by other, other artists. It was just amazing. Uh, next, I got to uh, tour the food services warehouse and space. I am so thankful for all the work that they do every day. This department, on a daily basis, provides over 25,000 meals to students. And, and that's every day. So thank you to Lindsay Aguilar for the tour. And I am so excited to see that space improve uh, after the roof and HVAC, are, HVAC is fixed. Uh, finally, I was grateful to be a part of the Asian Pacific and Refugee and also the Native American Student Services Department student recognition ceremonies. I am so proud of all the students who excelled in their education and received this recognition. And thank you to each department for all of the work you do organizing these events. And finally, I will be at uh, Mary Meredith tomorrow. 
uh, tomorrow evening. My son is graduating from Pima, so I will not be at a TOSD school, but I will be at Pima's uh, graduation. And then on Thursday, I will be at Pueblo. Thank you, Ms. Axerman. Congratulations to you and your family on the graduation. Mr. Romero. All right, so uh, going to kind of cut to the chase on a lot of these. Had a busy May. So um, Principal Jaquetta Alexander at Peter Howe, home of the Hawks. Kind of a cute little small school right over there. Not a lot of uh, a building over there, so we were able to get that pretty quickly. Uh, Principal Jesus Vasquez at Dietz, home of the Fierce Dragons. Not the, uh, the, the, the regular dragons, but they're fierce dragons, according to Principal Vasquez. And um, got to have my first um, cafeteria lunch um, <laughs> since I don't even know when. Uh, Principal uh, Lane or Ian Donovan at Booth Thicket, home of the Falcons, had a great uh, uh, visit there. Principal Brenda Menigan at Dodge, home of the Bulldogs. And I found out both Mansfield and Dodge are the Bulldogs, and there's an uh, inner bulldog uh, uh, war between those two, so uh, nice and fun. Uh, Principal Jennifer Figueroa at Whitmore, home of the Wildcats. Uh, Principal Diana Johnson at Ford, home of the Panthers. Uh, Principal Debbie Garcia at Seacrest, home of the Scorpions. And um, Principal Garcia is doing a lot of great things over there at Seacrest. Uh, got to meet Principal Tammy Ray at Santa Rita High School, home of the Eagles. Uh, Principal Sandra Thomas at Robbins, home of the Roadrunners. Uh, they're getting ready for um, promotion when I was out there this morning. Uh, Principal Carol Leeson at Cabot, home of the Eagles. I was also in attendance to see our Cabot Kindergartens promotions today. Uh, Principal Patricia Hurley at Innovative Tech High School, home of the Silver Knights. Got the tour along with Regional uh, Richard Sanchez. Beautiful, beautiful school. Uh, Principal Joseph Torres at Wakefield, home of the regular Knights, not the Silver Knights, the regular Knights. And that's a beautiful, beautiful campus. Their library is breathtaking. Um, and then I uh, closed out today with uh, Principal Frank Sammy Rossenhausel. If I said it wrong, I'm, I see you there. <laughs> We're just going to call him Sammy. Uh, at Pueblo, home of, the, home of the Warriors. I also attended a uh, PBIS celebration at Benias, where the scholars and myself had an opportunity to take turns to get Principal Savoni in the dunk tank. I was not successful in dunking Frankie, but many students and some staff were. I attended the year-end uh, neon dance party at Whitmore. Thank you again, Principal Jennifer Figueroa. Uh, hosted a first annual Principal Appreciation Barbecue Party, pulled pork, chicken, smoked peppers, roasted cream, potatoes, etc., in celebration of Principal Appreciation Day. Um, that was not TUSD funded, just so you know. Um, I appreciate all you do, and so does Dr. Trujillo and TUSD. So thank you very much uh, to our principals and our assistant principals. Uh, I was honored also to speak tonight at the uh, eighth grade promotion for the Fierce Deeds Dragon at the uh, Santa Rita High School Auditorium. I will be honored on Wednesday to speak at Sabino's graduation, and then on Thursday I'll be honored to speak at Rincon's. Uh, finally, a quick question for you, Dr. Trujillo. How many physical locations of school are there in TUSD? Locations? I'm going to say 89. Okay, so when I was elected, I made a commitment to myself in my first year to visit every school in the district. As of today, I'm one sh short of where I want to be. I have visited 43 schools in my first six months. But wait, I will be visiting school number 44, Principal Brenda Encinas at Wright Elementary on Thursday, May 25th, the last day of school. So if I've not visited your school yet, I will be there next school year. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Romero. <laughs> A lot of great work from my colleagues, and I'll add on my board member activity report. Uh, since our last uh, board member activity report, end of April, I had an opportunity to make a tour of our uh, Southwest Tucson Elementary Schools, reading at Grijalva, Warren, and Maldonado Elementary Schools. And thank you, Principals Chavez, uh, Ronsman, and Ramirez for the tours and updates on the amazing programs at your schools. Uh, like uh, for my three of my other colleagues, I was able to uh, join many of our community in supporting our students at the drag performance held at Tucson High in uh, end of April. Uh, I headed to the east side of TUSD in early May to visit for the first time Wheeler Elementary and Dietz K-8. Uh, thank you, Principal Saldamando and Vasquez for their introductions to your amazing communities. Uh, I was able to cheer on the Tucson High Badger Boys Volleyball team as they qualify for regionals a few weeks ago and joined um, many in our community supporting our student performers at the district-wide OMA showcase at Palo Verde. Uh, with Ms. Uh, Shaw, I was able to join TEA for the Code of Conduct Forum, and thank you for our TEA leaders for uh, organizing that. 
Uh, and then finally, I had a multiple of the trips to Line Weaver for the end of year events, as well as a special trip to read to my daughter's fifth grade class. So when I go to these schools, usually read to like kindergarten and first grade students, I feel really comfortable doing that, but I get really intimidated with the older kids. And so I, I had to read to my fifth grader, my, my daughter's fifth grade class, uh, and nothing was more intimidating than reading to them. But luckily, I've known a lot of these students since preschool, since she's been with them for, for so many years. I uh, had a great uh, conversation with a lot of them and asked a lot of great questions about the school board, about our district, and, and had a great conversation before reading some of my, uh, one of my favorite books in middle school, Treasure Island. Uh, and so got to introduce the fifth graders to uh, that amazing uh, book. Uh, this year, uh, I'll be at, or this week, excuse me, I'll be attending the Tucson High graduation tomorrow and speaking there. Uh, and then on Thursday, the TAP graduation uh, and the fifth grade promotion at Lime Weaver Elementary, of course. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I really love hearing all your amazing uh, board member reports. This would be a really quick uh, part of our agenda if we didn't care so much about our district uh, and making sure that we were present and visiting uh, all of the schools in some cases, but at least a, a good portion of them. So thank you to my uh, colleagues for all of your visits to our, our amazing district. All right, next on our agenda is our call to the audience. and I'll turn it over to our clerk, uh, Mr. Romero, for guidelines. Public participation in board meetings. Members of the public may speak during the call to the audience. The governing board clerk shall be responsible for recognizing speakers and maintaining order where it may be appropriate. Those who speak in person or want to have their comments read shall email or call the board office to complete a request to address the board form before the meeting. Speakers who have not completed a request form are not permitted to address the board. The speaker must state their full name and topic prior to addressing the board. Speakers are encouraged to be brief with a maximum time of three minutes. While more than one speaker may speak together in the time allowed, speakers are reminded that they are not allowed to speak more than once and they may not transfer their or delegate their time to others. If there are documents for the board, please give them to a board office staff and they will ensure each board member receives a copy. Those attending the meeting and are speaking out before the board shall observe rules of good conduct. Speakers should also refrain from inappropriate or slanderous remarks. And because TUSD serves students from preschool through high school, speakers should be aware that there be, may be children present and listening. At the end of the call to the audience, the governing board president will ask if any board members wishes to respond to criticism, wish to ask staff for a review of a matter, or wish to ask a matter be put on a future agenda. No more than two members may address each topic. Contents of this card are public information. All right, so first up, um, we have Cristobal Santa Cruz, followed by Evan Cook. time when the time begins okay uh, some of you have already um, know read a letter that I wrote on change.org along with some other colleagues um, if you do not I want to present myself I've taught for the district for 30 years I've been in front of this board uh, for awards I my father was a t teacher for 40 years and part of the reason why I'm here folks and why I was prompted to write that letter is something I want you to understand, and I hope that there is no disconnect, that there is no misunderstanding in what I say. What is happening with the, I, with the code of conduct, the code of conduct we currently have, this is coming from a 30-year veteran, is not working. There is, it seems to be a disconnect between the people who make the code of conduct and the people who are in the trenches every day. Um, a funny thing, folks, that I, I want you guys to understand is that um, one of the uh, jobs that my father does uh, after 40 years of teaching, he runs uh, the alumni, uh, honor alumni of, uh, at Pueblo High School. And you know the interesting thing when I go to those banquets that I hear? Time and time again, everybody who speaks, doctors, lawyers, successful people, they give credit to teachers. And, and it, is not, it is not for the geometry class that you taught, nor the biology that you taught. It is something that you instilled in the child, whether, whether it be responsibility, proper behavior. That's what they continue to go back to time and time again. I once heard my father correct an administrator one time. It was during summer school. And the administrator said, well, you know, it's all about the, 
the numbers, it's money, when he was talking about registration of students. And you know what my father said? He said, no, it is not. It is not. It's about education. And part of that education, ladies and gentlemen, is teaching children right from wrong. And that is not happening. Your the behavior, the conduct forums, I went to two of them, are proof enough of that. I do not have to go over horror story over horror story. And my letter refers to that. So please understand this. I'm speaking to you. This is a plea. This is a plea for your help. For where's teachers who want to do their job effectively. And we feel we cannot. There's administrators who want to do their job effectively. And they cannot. And we need your help. As part of that, we have seven or six suggestions that we would make in order to have a, a restorative a restorative time sorry okay thank you evan evan cook followed by vicky allison we have three minutes good thank you i'm vicky allison i've uh, <clears throat> been living in the tusc school district for over 25, 30 years, I went to Rincon, uh, my kids went to Rincon, I went to Tucson High, I went to um, Naylor Junior High, Julia Keene, back in the old days. And to tell you the truth right now, I don't recognize what's going on in the schools, to be honest with you. Um, I'm an LD, I'm, involved, I'm a precinct person. I decided to get involved in that, unfortunately, and it's very heartbreaking and very dis disconcerting and very depressing in some cases. I came to a board meeting regarding the drag event and I wanted to, and I, which I was against, not because I'm against transgenders or drag or drag shows. But I didn't think a school was a proper place for it. Well, we were sitting here listening to them talk, where they were all dressed up in in their drag outfits. Um, we respectfully sat there and listened, and then we were turned around and they blocked us. And nobody from this school board, except for Vals, said anything. They were harassing us. They were threatening us. They were cursing at us. They were holding a desecrated flag in front of me, and nobody did anything, said anything to the parents. And you know, those kids aren't the voters. We're the voters. I seen grandparents walk out of here because they were frightened. It was frightening being in the middle of that, and none of you said anything to us. I was, I was stressed out leaving this meeting, and that's because we just wanted to say we didn't want the drag show. And then my friends that did go to the drag show, some they said that some people were not able to get in because they thought they were wearing a cross or they look like they might be religious, so they're not letting certain people in, and I didn't understand why that would be. Also, I heard that at some of the drag shows, in fact, there was videos that a friend of mine has that's showing kids removing clothing while teachers and counselors are cheering on. Now, I don't understand what kind of world that's correct. It doesn't make sense to me. So whatever drag show you went to, that's what kids were doing. I totally disagree with that, and it's just, wrong for kids to have to go to have to do that or to be doing that in a school and this isn't the place for it this isn't the america i grew up really not every time i say the pledge of allegiance i want to cry because i don't recognize it this is about education teaching these kids to be on their own teaching them to be self-sufficient i don't see how a drag show is going to teach them to be a self-sufficient person to be able to earn a living i appreciate that they have their feelings and emotions and needs but this is a place of learning and not to favor one group or not, but to represent all the children and to let all the parents speak or all the uh, TSD uh, residents speak. And I was afraid to speak. I was afraid to speak right now because the last week, because uh, what happened last time and being threatened and surrounded. And nobody on the school board said nothing or apologized to us or anything. And we were perfectly respectful and said nothing. They were using curse words and nobody said a thing. And I just want to mention that. Thank you for your time. So did we have an Evan Cook or, yes, Evan, okay, Evan, you're up. And then followed up by Margaret Cheney. Hello there, uh, just let me know when the time, time is okay, thank you. My name is Evan Cook, I'm an itinerant sub from TOSD. Uh, I was initially given the privilege to uh, work with Stafford K-8 uh, but unfortunately, due to an emergency situation, I was uh, put at Hollinger K-8. 
Uh, I come before you today, uh, there were five teachers removed from that school. Um, and that is the reason why I was there. And I quickly found out why, as students began to threaten my career and then my life. Last Tuesday, they followed through on that career after three police reports were made. And you can see the result of that right here. But what you can't see is the blindness in my right eye and the damage to my kidneys that will follow me for the rest of my life as this situation is brushed under the rug and I will be forgotten. I ask every person here in this room and not just the board, when will it be a teacher that we lose? When will it be another child that we lose? Something has to be done before it's too late because it was almost too late for me on Tuesday as I almost had a heart attack and a stroke. That took bodily autonomy away from me. There are amazing people in this room that work hard every single day. Do we lose them? Because we can't make change. Yes, I want justice. Yes, I'm upset. Yes, I want reparation. But that justice does not end with me. It does not extend to just me. It extends to every person wearing a red shirt in this room. To every staff member that was threatened, who, that I witnessed almost get punched out. And nothing done about it. Thank you for your time. Margaret Cheney, followed up by Taylor Pacheco. Thank you. Good evening, board members, Dr. Trujillo, Ms. Pena, and special counsel. First, let me tell you that TEA continues to be grateful for the changes in salary schedules and wages implemented by this board. We are especially grateful for the right to explore our budget further in the fall, thanks to our ongoing partnership. Tonight, though, you will hear testimony from across the district pertaining to the current student code of conduct and requests for much needed changes. By now, you know that despite our efforts to counsel and support students and staff alike, there is a certain order that must be maintained so that those in, who need support are allowed to attain it and those who are in the process of working and learning are allowed to do just that without seemingly daily disruptions. Teachers and staff deserve respect and support just like our students and parents. And while measures have been taken to secure this to some degree, everyone must understand and adhere to meaningful consequences and accountability. Staff should feel supported by the admin and should have clear authority to control their campuses with rules that pertain to all and are given without bias. To the same, at the same time, knowing that everyone makes mistakes, we must give some autonomy to sites and grade levels to create ways to support that occasional slip up. It is difficult to determine these things and we want you to know that the Code of Conduct Committee took all of this into consideration before coming up with a revision. I hope that you do listen to what is said tonight and take heed. It is indeed a mighty lift, but please remember, no matter what changes take place, if we do not have the resources or at least the majority agreement of all stakeholders, this and any other plan will not land on its feet. Every situation is different, every child is different, every teacher and staff member is different. Along these same lines, it is, it, if we as adults do not treat each other the way ex we expect our children to behave, those children will see our hypocrisy immediately and outfox us on all fronts. To try to resolve this issue, TEA will, solve a, will send a copy of the staff discipline matrix to every administrator across the district before leaving office. We, want, we all want, need, and deserve respect and kindness no matter what, no matter who, no matter where. I leave you with these lyrics from Into the Woods from Stephen Sondheim. Careful the things you say, children will listen. Careful the things you do, children will see and learn. Children may not obey, but children will listen. Children will look to you for which way to turn to learn what to be. Careful before you say, listen to me, children will listen. It has been a pleasure to work with you all. Thank you so much. 
Taylor Pacheco, followed by Sybil uh, du Duzel Zenli. Hi, I'm Taylor Pacheco. I'm a math teacher at Pueblo High School, and I was also part of the Budget Advisory Committee. Um, but today I'm actually here to speak for the students from that perspective. Um, I had a student come to me who had heard about the code of conduct changing, and she felt that this was very important to her. Um, she came to me asking for some advice, helping her um, prepare a letter to you guys that I hope she'll be ready to share at the next meeting. Um, but I just wanted to let you know the concerns that she and other students have brought forward in this. Um, first is the disrespect towards teachers. That was their first priority. Um, they said that that makes them feel unsafe in the classroom. If a student is talking to a teacher in that way, and they're just a student, how, are the, how is that other student going to treat them? Um, the second concern they had was um, what goes on in our bathrooms, um, that that makes them feel unsafe just to use the restroom. Um, drugs, you know, violence in the restrooms, that they feel like they can't be safe in there. Um, their third concern was consequences being applied unfairly, um, which is what our code of conduct should be used for, is to make sure that every student is treated the same way when they do the same thing. Um, and the fourth was that there was not enough communication about the reality of the situation that students are in at schools these days. Um, my student said, if my dad knows if my dad knew what went on at this school, he would take me out immediately. But this is not something that just happens at Pueblo or even just at TUSD, but the change needs to start here. Thank you. Sybil? Hello, uh, my name is Sibel Duzenli. I also work with Taylor at Pueblo High School, um, and I also want to speak on the urgency of needing a new and effective code of conduct um, that can be applied fairly to all students. Uh, I've also been seeing the same issues with our bathrooms. I have students who ask specifically to get a pass to go to the nurse's office so that they can have a safe and comfortable place to go to the bathroom to take care of an essential daily need. Um, we also had a gun on our campus. We had fentanyl on our campus. Again, they were in the bathrooms. And this all is, to me, pointing towards not only a need for um, a code of conduct that can address these issues, but also a lot more funding for staff, for more monitors on our campuses, and for a set student to adult ratio on our campuses so that we can actively you know, ensure the safety of each other. Um, because right now, those uh, ratios are wholly inadequate, and our students are suffering, and our, um, our people are suffering. So yeah, I'd like to see an increase in spending allocated specifically for monitors and for suspension staff. Um, I actually started in the district in the DAEP, the District Alternative Education Program. Um, and I think that that's a really important pathway for students to be able to have clear consequences, but to not lose out on their educational potential, their academic and personal potential. So I, would, I think it would be really important to utilize the programs that the district already has and to connect them and to strengthen them through this revision of the code of conduct so that we can have a stronger district and safer and healthier schools. Um, I also, uh, on a personal note, I'm an art teacher at Pueblo High School, and uh, we, I have had a broken sink for many years, um, and that's just connected to a larger issues at our campus. Um, we have an old building. Our facilities need care. Our plumbing systems need care. Um, our district needs to help us with these major, uh, major concerns. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, the, the next, the rest of them are going to be uh, to be read by uh, Yolanda. But before I do that, uh, just real quick, uh, Cristobal Santa Cruz, I just wanted to ask, I want to hear the, I, I have to maintain the three minutes, if you can send that email to us. Um, and um, Yolanda, can you take it over from here? Hello, I already emailed this email to the Code of Conduct Committee, but I wanted to share how I feel about the Code of Conduct with the board too. I'm Arturo Mendoza and I'm in fifth grade at Kellon Elementary School, about to go into sixth. 
Some things have been happening at my school that I have felt very strongly about. I have reached out to my teacher and my classmates to talk about it, and I have read the Code of Conduct with my parents. Overall, I like many of the ideas in the Code of Conduct, especially restorative practices and PBIS. But I feel like there are a few holes that can be fixed, especially now because of your committee is rewriting the Code of Conduct. One change that I think could be made is creating a system where repeated behavior is treated differently than just a one-time incident. Throughout this year, I have been noticing repeated behavior from just a few students that has not been addressed properly, and because of this, I think that the behaviors just keep happening. If the code of conduct were to give teachers more availability to give harsher punishments for repeated behaviors, then I feel like this would change a lot of behaviors. Because the, be the teacher is watching the students almost all day, the teacher knows their behavior best and what to do about it. My classmates have helped to give me an idea for a consequence system. One idea is that three level one violations per semester should be treated as a level two for consequences. And then three level two violations should be treated as a level three for consequences and so on. For example, if a student has one incident of a minor aggressive act as they're mis messing around with friends or something, the consequence could be an in-school plan or lunch detention or something similar, level two. But if they don't learn their lesson and do it multiple times after they've already been warned, the consequences should be heightened level three. This makes sense because if minor aggression acts are happening multiple times, it is closer to endangerment, bullying, or other aggression, which are already level three violations. This system could apply to a lot of issues, but I feel like I want a change specifically about repeated aggressive acts, even without serious physical injury to another person. These aggressive acts will violate someone else's body, often without their permission or consent. I have seen many acts of this at school, and I think the district needs to be tougher about this to make them stop. Other students agree that we want a safe learning environment with no, vi with no violence to our bodies or selves. In the Code of Conduct, it seems that the district's attention is placed on high school students, but patterns of bad behaviors mostly start earlier, like in elementary schools. I do understand that young children may sometimes need lighter consequences or not, no consequences at all when they are too young to understand how their behavior affects other people or are still learning. However, when they are the same behaviors over and over or are older students in elementary schools, they have a better understanding of what expected of them and should be held responsible for their behaviors. I do hope you take time. We're going to be at the 20 minute mark for call to the audience. Thank you, Ms. Pena. So uh, during our regular, our, our special board meetings, it's only scheduled for 20 minutes. I believe all the other comments are to be read and emailed and can be sent to us. All right, is there any comments from the governing board members? Um, this is a chance for governing board members to uh, respond uh, to criticism, wish to ask staff to review a matter, or wish to ask the matter be put on a future agenda. No more than two members may address any particular topic. Dr. Shaw. Yes, Ms. Uh, Shaw. Thank you. If I may, uh, Ms. Pena, how many more letters do we have? There's eight more. I would like to uh, move to extend the call to the audience. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second to extend a call to the audience. Uh, we know we have a lot on our agenda, including an almost an hour-long presentation on uh, the um, bond potential, uh, code of conduct, which I know a lot of folks are here, over a dozen candidates to approve uh, for assistant principals and principalships. And so mm -hmm. any other comments uh, from our board before we uh, vote on this item? If I may. Um, Michelle. Thank you. I just feel like it's pertinent. Uh, we have a lot to discuss and to do so without like the, the people who have, you know, put in the energy to send in a comment to not hear it before, you know, we discuss these items. Um, I assume many of them are in relation to the code of conduct, Ms. Pena, or code of conduct, yeah. So I would like to hear the, the remaining letters. And the code of conduct is only informational only tonight. There are no decisions being made on the code of conduct tonight. I know. All right. Roll call vote, Ms. Pena. Ms. Ekstrom? No. Ms. Luna Rose? No. no. Mr. Romero? Yes. Ms. Shaw? Yes. Dr. Ravi? No. All right, item fails uh, three, two. 
Uh, so we're going to move on. Uh, or this is a chance for board members to make any uh, comments or, or uh, ask things to be put on the future agendas. Michelle, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who uh, spoke tonight and wrote in to us. Um, if we could get those uh, remaining letters forwarded to us. Ms. Pena, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Santa Cruz for uh, speaking to us about uh, the concerns that he has. And please do send us uh, the change.org petition. Um, I'm not sure if he's in the room, but uh, very interested to see that. And you have a lot of great points. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's see. And uh, if we could get, uh, from uh, in regards to Mr. Cook and um, the things that he experienced. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, if we could get a brief on that, please. Um, thank you, Ms. Cheney, for all your work um, with TEA and um, you know asking for real accountability. I agree with that. Um, let's see. And Cibel, thank you, Cibel, for coming to speak about um, all of that. Um, she was my peer at art school. Um, and oh my goodness, uh, Dr. Trujillo, can we look into getting her sink fixed? Because as an art teacher, like you're very limited without a working sink. Absolutely, we will Thank definitely you. connect with Mr. R. So anybody having uh, challenges with uh, Mr. R's last name, I just call him Mr. R. So that's just an advice to you, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Same. Thank you, Mr. R. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, uh, Arturo Mendoza, for uh, speaking so eloquently about the things that you're seeing at your school. Um, and um, if Ms. Warmbrand, uh, he sent the letter to you as well, if you could review some of his suggestions, please. Um, and uh, I apologize to Ms. Allison, who um, you know experienced some things at that one governing board meeting. Um, you know, we've been briefed about the powers that uh, the governing board members can have. And um, I think, you know, moving forward, uh, we'll certainly um, definitely try to keep the boardroom in, in order and make sure everybody's rights are um, respected. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Ms. Shah. Anyone else? Mr. Romero. Uh, yes, I wanted to also reiterate um, what Ms. Shaw had mentioned, uh, Vicki Allison. Um, you're not feeling safe within a board meeting when it should be, you know, something that's held civilly um, and everybody should be respectful of everybody else. We apologize that happened to you and I'm glad you spoke out about it because if you felt that way, I'm sure it wasn't just an isolated uh, issue. I'm sure other people felt that same way and perhaps, you know, were not able to speak out and maybe that's why they, they wrote into the audience because of, of things of that nature. Um, I am, am accountable for running the meeting. I was not prepared. I should have had more control of that meeting. So uh, I mentioned this last uh, last meeting that um, I am going to do much better and I'll make sure there's order in this in this board um, and they pulled out my gavel. So now I've got this. I throw it too if I need to, just kidding. So thank you for bringing <laughs> it to our attention. I'll throw in the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Luna Rose. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, Yes, I would like to, um, I'm, I am concerned. Thank you, Mr. Cook, for coming and speaking. And um, I'm hoping that perhaps I can get, we can get more background of what's happened there. Um, so again, I appreciate your time. Um, and to um, Arturo Mendoza, um, I highly encourage, uh, for those who are watching, I know school's ending soon, but um, this school district is yours as a student, and you have a right at any time to conduct to, uh, to come, to speak, to send us emails. Um, we want to hear from the students because this is your school. This is your school district. This is your school. And as an alumni of this district, I feel very strongly about that. So thank you, Arturo, for for sending that uh, very well uh, written letter. Thank you, Ms. Luna Rose, and thank you everyone uh, who spoke tonight and for everyone for writing in. All those comments will be sent to us, even if they weren't read tonight, uh, for us to review. Uh, and none of the items, um, we have a list of items, none of them were any action items for tonight's meeting. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone uh, that our next meeting on June 6th is an uh, information study uh, meeting. It's a special board meeting. There will be no call to the audience at the June 6th meeting. 
The June 13th meeting is our normal board meeting, our full board meeting uh, with a call to the audience and action items uh, planned for that agenda. Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to our next item, uh, which is 9.2, bond consulting, bond consultant polling results and potential bond package November 2023. Dr. Trujillo. Uh, members of the governing board, uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, colleagues from uh, uh, Havelina Consulting. Uh, they are here to report to the board on the results of their uh, preliminary surveying of the electorate, or at least a slice of the electorate, regarding the feasibility, the current attitudes, opinions, uh, trends, and beliefs uh, in a potential bond effort for the Tucson Unified School Community. I think we heard during call to the audience several con concerns about facilities and conditions of classrooms and plumbing systems and electrical systems right on par uh, with what we asked our consultants from Havelina to go out and talk to the community about. So they're gonna take us to a presentation. We've built in time, uh, not only for the presentation, but also for governing board member questions and comments, concerns uh, throughout the presentation as well. So I'd like to turn it over to our friends uh, from Havelina Consulting and take it away. Uh, Gene, I believe you have their presentation up. And I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Justin Plum and David. Did I don't remember your last name, so if you can handle the introduction, that would be great. Uh, Superintendent Trujillo. My name is Rick Sklars. I am a senior vice president at FM3 Research, uh, and we conducted the survey on behalf of the, the district, so we can move right into it. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just a summary of how the survey was conducted. You can see the dates of the interviews there. So just about a month ago, we conducted the survey, and we do that we refer to it as dual mode voter survey. And what that means is we conduct the survey via live telephone calls to landline and cell phones, as well as sending email, uh, emails and text messaging out to uh, the public to invite them to take the survey online. So it's both on the telephone with live interviewers, but also online to make sure we get uh, a broad coverage of the entire district. And you can see the research population here is the Tucson Unified School District likely November 2023 voters. So it is a subset of your registered voters uh, within the district because this is projecting out to a potential uh, putting the bond measure on this coming year in the November election. So we wanted to concentrate on those voters who in the past have shown up and voted in those off year, uh, odd year elections. So we interviewed them. We did a total of 619 interviews uh, for the full sample, when we're looking at all the data together, there's a margin of error of plus or minus 4%. Uh, the margin of error will increase if we start looking at subgroups such by gender or age or ethnicity. But for the most part, when we're looking at the main survey results, 4% is something to keep in mind. And then lastly, we conducted interviews both in English and Spanish. So we can move to the next slide. Just going to give you a sense of sort of overview before getting into the bond measure specifically. So on the next slide, you'll see a question here where we asked, we presented the respondents with a series of issues and asked them to rate how serious of a problem is this for people who live in Tucson? Is it extremely serious, which is the dark red, uh, very serious, which is sort of the medium grade pink, the lightest pink is somewhat serious, and then the blue is not a serious problem, the gray is don't know. And what's interesting in your district here is you can see the education related issues, particularly a shortage of classroom teachers and the amount of funding available for education in Arizona's public schools are really at the top of the list and pretty much in line with where inflation and rising prices are. And then quality of education in Tucson public schools is right behind that. And those four issues are at the top of the list. And it's interesting because we do this research throughout uh, the country, both in Arizona as well as states around the U.S., um, and the fact that 
education related issues are just as high and in some respects higher than inflation and rising prices is sort of a unique thing. Uh, in most communities right now, when we talk about inflation, talk about rising prices, cost of living issues, those tend to be the, the biggest, most serious problem. In your community, it's a, clearly a big concern for a lot of the, the voters, but so are education related issues. So the issue of education, concerns about public schools in your community uh, is on par, if not higher than uh, inflation right now. And then on the list, you can also see in the middle there, 66% extremely or very student safety at local public schools. Heard some of that in the discussion a few minutes ago. Uh, there's clearly a lot of people in this community who are concerned about student safety. Um, and then you can see towards the bottom of the list, uh, the condition of the local economy. Roughly half are say it's an extremely or very serious problem, uh, but clearly not as intense or concerning as some of the other issues. And then the amount you pay in local property taxes uh, is at the bottom of this list. And actually more than a third, 35% are saying not a serious problem. So the economy and taxes for right now are sort of at the low end of concern, whereas education uh, related issues and then inflation are at the top of the list. Okay, so now we'll get into their views of the school district. And on this first slide, we go to the next one, we ask, do you approve or disapprove of the, uh, whoop, uh, okay, moving on to this slide. Okay, there we go. Uh, approve or disapprove of the job being done by the Tucson Unified School District. And you can see just under half, 47% say they disapprove, 41% say they approve. Now, this isn't necessarily surprising given the data we just went through, which suggests education is a big concern. They see a lot of problems related to public schools, education. Uh, what's noticeable on the right side, sort of showing you some of the demographics underneath those numbers, uh, there's a big distinction here by party and ideological lines. Uh, there's sort of a partisan split where we're seeing a majority of Democrats and liberals, not necessarily the greatest numbers, but mo more than half majority approve of the district, whereas the more uh, conservative Republican voters, they are more uh, disapproving, about three quarters are disapprove. And then going down the, the slide, you can see how the respondents based on whether they have children or do not have children in the home. Uh, you can see those who have children a little more uh, majority disapprove, whereas those who do not have the children in the home, they are evenly split. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, in addition to just asking the district overall, we asked about their schools. And it's sort of interesting when we ask people about your neighborhood public schools, we get a more positive result than when we say Tucson Unified Public Schools. And this is pretty consistent with research we do around the country. Um, people feel better about the schools in their neighborhood. You know, you know that school, maybe it's a school your child currently goes to or went to. It's the one that you are most uh, familiar with. So you generally have a feeling, a more positive attitude with it. When you talk about the Unified Tucson Unified overall, those numbers look very similar to what you just saw in the previous slide, where just under half are saying they disapprove. And then you can see the superintendent as sort of the, the leader of the district, four in 10 approve, three in 10 disapprove, but there's clear a lot of people who haven't made their mind up about uh, Dr. Trujillo. And then the state superintendent, uh, a majority of Tucson Unified District uh, voters say they disapprove of uh, Tom Horn, and you can see the dark red in this bar, which is strongly disapproved, uh, is pretty intense there, almost at four and ten. We we'll go to the next slide. On this slide, we presented the respondents with a series of statements and asked them to say assess whether that was an accurate or inaccurate statement. The dark blue is very accurate. The light blue, somewhat accurate. Pink, somewhat inaccurate. Dark red, very inaccurate. Gray, don't know. And you can see here, we have some pretty strong uh, agreement or accuracy for statements. Again, the sense that Tucson Unified needs additional funding, that there's a lack of funding we saw earlier for Arizona public schools generally. Here, now we're specifying it to their district uh, to provide students with a quality education. 55% say that is a very accurate statement, a pretty strong level uh, of agreement. And another 21% say somewhat accurate just two in 10 in total say inaccurate. Uh, again, safety being an important issue, again, 
seeing three quarters saying neighborhood schools need upgrades to ensure student safety and security. And then you can see also uh, a very large accuracy for the perception that strong schools will improve my property value. So there's sort of this awareness and connection that good schools and property values move hand in hand. And then uh, several other statements here, you can see a, a narrow majority, 52% sort of uh, disagree with the idea, say it's inaccurate that rising inflation, a high cost of living uh, is not the right time to raise property taxes, even if it's for local schools. So there is a, a disagreement with that, that maybe schools are important enough that even in those are concerns. Uh, and then you can see here, Tucson Unified is fiscally responsible, uses taxpayer money efficiently. A little more say that's inaccurate. Uh, again, you know, that might sort of, that number that's saying inaccurate is pretty similar to what they said is uh, disapprove of the job the district's doing. So those numbers are consistent. And then lastly on this slide, uh, the issue of the desegregation order uh, requiring homeowners to pay additional local property taxes. Uh, roughly half of the respondents in the survey don't know whether the statement's accurate or inaccurate. Uh, and then you've got a basically those who do have a sense of it, they are divided as to whether this is a, an accurate statement or not. So now we'll finally get into the actual bond measure that we've been discussing. And on the first slide you see here, we gave the respondents the very sort of simple, straightforward yes or no statement that would appear on the ballot. Uh, as it would if this was election day and they were walking in and voting. And so they get the yes vote shall authorize Tucson Unified School District Governing Board to issue and sell $480 million of school improvement bonds of the district. A no vote is no to that. And you can see here we asked the yes or no, but also again, as we do with all these questions, the degree to which they are supporting this definitely, probably are leaning. And you can see here uh, six and 10, slightly more than six and 10 in total are voting yes, with a third saying definitely yes. So sort of right off the bat, we haven't really given them much information about what this bond measure is other than these two lines of a yes and a no vote. So there's a solid uh, initial support and you can see just over a third are voting no. It's worth noting the definitely yes to definitely no uh, margin here. So. You know, it's a, a pretty solid definitely yes vote, but two in 10 are definitely no. So there's a, a, a clear group of voters who off the bat are saying no, but there are more saying they are strongly for this. The next set of slides gives you just sort of a sense of demographically how these look. Not much of a gender gap here. Men and women both roughly supportive in the same uh, degree, but there's clearly a partisan difference. Democrats at 80% overwhelmingly voting in favor of the bond. Uh, independents, a majority are voting yes, but it's not as strong. Little, you know, only 22% definitely yes. And then Republicans, a third voting in favor, roughly two thirds oppose it. Uh, and then by uh, race and ethnicity, two thirds of whites vote yes. Uh, Latinos and all voters of color just at a, a majority voting in favor. Uh, sorry, I didn't, there's a question or, oh, okay. Uh, you can see not much of a difference here by, again, the party, uh, party by gender, strong support from Democrats, regardless of gender, uh, factoring in the margin of error, not much difference by, uh, among independents, maybe a little stronger sort of, uh, commitment among independent women, but not fundamentally that different. Uh, and then again, Republican women, a little stronger support, uh, but still uh, more than six in 10, regardless of gender, uh, Republicans voting against it. Uh, liberal, moderate, conservative looks very much like the party breakdowns, which is not a surprise. Liberals and Democrats, pretty similar. Conservatives and Republicans uh, move together as well. Go to the next slide. These are different projects that we tested for the bond measure, funds that could be, how the funds potentially could be used. Uh, and you can see here, we asked, the question was, how important is this? The dark blue is extremely important. The sort of mid medium blue is very, the light blue somewhat important, the red not to, and again, gray don't know. And so all of these projects, you know, have a, a fairly high level of support, but you can see up at the top, just the basic idea of repair, repairing deteriorating schools and classrooms 
84% say that is either extremely or very important. So just the basic fundamental idea, we need to fix uh, schools that are outdated or they're deteriorating. Similarly, upgrading air conditioning and ventilation systems, eight and 10, extremely or very important. You can see safety here, improving classrooms, labs, equipment for science, technology, the arts, healthcare. So providing all the uh, in-classroom equipment to improve education programs, wiring, Wi-Fi, improve classroom technology, upgrading libraries and labs. So all of these sort of fundamental things that schools need, uh, just basic repairs as well as the actual technology or equipment used in classroom uh, resonates as highly important to your, your, your voters. And again, on the next slide, you can see these are a little lower, but still at the top of the list here in this second set of items, uh, fire security items, technology security, uh, improving arts and music, improving public school plumbing, irrigation systems to increase water conservation. And then sort of towards the bottom of the list on this slide, online learning opportunities, and athletic facilities. I think, you know, we can consistently in our research find the public is less inclined to support or think it's less important to use funds to upgrade athletic facilities. That tends to be at a lower priority. And I think sort of post, uh, you know, the, the peak of the pandemic, there's a less of an interest in investing in online learning. Uh, the public really wants students back in the classroom, seeing the the importance of being in person. So this has certainly come down from where it was several years ago. Okay. Uh, the next uh, set of questions sort of replicate a potential community outreach program, uh, educate the public about the challenges facing Tucson Unified. So on this next slide, what you're seeing are just statements of why, uh, what the district's challenges are, what the, the, the goals of a uh, funding package potentially could be. And, and what you're seeing here is a statement and the percentage to the left, <coughs> excuse me, is the percentage of respondents who say they strongly agree with that statement. And thematically, the idea that investing in math and science and technology programs is an important thing to provide students with the resources and the access to uh, education programs that are really important in today's world. Uh, an economy that really uh, requires a foundation in math, science, and technology. Safety, you know, I think it's sort of a basic fundamental truth that, you know, we need to keep schools safe. Students and teachers can only learn if they're in safe uh, classrooms and schools, which is critical. Uh, repairs, making sure students are in, you know, good quality classrooms. There's a lot of older buildings in the district that just need basic repairs from HVAC improvement to plumbing, electrical wiring, energy efficiency, just and fundamentally replacing desks and classroom equipment. So there's just basic fundamental improvements that need to be made. And then lastly on this slide, nearly half also strongly agree that, you know, it's time. We haven't done a, a major bond investment for this district in uh, nearly 20 years and just over time needs rise and you know we have to make that investment in our local schools to make sure uh, students have the quality education they deserve. So we can move to the next slide and tested several other statements. Uh, every school this bond is designed to ensure schools throughout the district are uh, benefiting not you know every school gets some degree of improvements more than four in 10 say it's, they strongly agree that investing in career education is highly important. Uh, you can see a third strongly agree teacher retention. If we upgrade schools, if we provide quality classrooms, teachers are going to want to stay here and good teachers are going to want to teach in our district. And then lastly on this list, you see the accountability uh, requirements of, a, of a, the district, how it has a record of oversight with the community, ensuring transparency. Uh, not necessarily the strongest statement, but again, something that often we find the public wants to hear. They want to know that there are audits, there are expenditure reports, so the public can know where funds are being spent. And the next slide. And this just combined, so I showed you the strongly agree for each of those statements, and now the, the blue is somewhat agree. And you can see there's really a lot of buy-in for these uh, statements among your, your community. 
particularly the math, science, and technology is part of that as well. Uh, investing in making schools safer, the need for repairs. So there is a high degree of agreement that you know the basic needs of this district are significant, and there's a re reason uh, to invest in those in your public schools. Okay. Uh, so we sort of follow the trajectory. So we did that initial uh, vote that I showed you up front. And then after these community education statements, you can see support for the measure increases for a potential bond measure. Uh, it's now at 70% total yes, with nearly half, 48%, saying definitely yes. You can see the total no, you know, it changes a little, but not too much. And that definitely no isn't moving so much. So you know, two in 10 voters in your district are, you know, sort of fundamentally a hard no on this. Uh, that's probably a, a indication that there's a core group of voters who, no matter what, are, aren't going to support the measure. But there's clearly a lot of uh, response to this bond measure as the public learns more about the district, how funds would be used, the, the challenges and needs that the district has uh, to provide better quality schools. And this slide just shows you among those who where that additional yes vote comes from. And it was sort of interesting to see uh, Latinos, particularly uh, people interviewed in Spanish in our survey, they were among the biggest increase in support after they got more information about uh, the district's challenges and how bond measure funds could be used to improve classrooms and schools. Uh -huh. We did want to sort of give the other half of the argument, people who may oppose uh, a bond measure and think the district is, you know, it's not worth investing or this is not an appropriate way to invest in the district and sort of the argument that we can't afford higher taxes. This is a time of rising inflation, rising prices. Uh, this is just not the time to do it. And you can see three in 10 strongly agree with that statement. Uh, an argument that schools are sort of not take focusing on the basics. They're teaching things that uh, don't have to do with the fundamentals of education. Sort of the woke idea is 30% strongly agree. Uh, one in four strongly agree that the district is wasting too much money, that this bond is too big for the district, uh, that cut cutting wasteful spending, being more uh, fiscally responsible is a better way to go. And then two in 10 identify uh, the message, the statement about the desegregation property tax, uh, providing millions of dollars for the district, uh, agree with that statement, making this bond unnecessary. And here again, you can see adding in the somewhat agree to these statements, much less impactful than the, the prior statements, the raising the sort of uh, issues that the district's challenging, challenges the district faces and the benefits investing in schools. Uh, so the only one here that reaches 50% is the, the argument about taxes. Huh? That being said, sort of playing this out, if it was sort of a, a campaign style situation and people were arguing uh, against the bond measure, you can see support does come back down to its original level. Just over 6 and 10, 64% are saying, yes, uh, I would still vote in favor of the bond even after hearing those statements against it. A little more than a third, 36%, say they would vote no. And the last slide, couple slides here just sort of show you, you know, we have these various votes over the course of the survey and who's mo who those groups are. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you can see... Um, there, in that blue piece of the pie, there are more than four in 10 respondents in the survey who every time we ask, would you vote yes or no on the bond measure, they say they would vote definitely or probably yes. So there's a core of about 40%, give or take, who are pretty strongly committed to supporting the bond measure uh, throughout the survey. In comparison, there's only 14% who are equally opposed. Uh, they say definitely no or probably no throughout the survey. So by three to one, the sort of core supporters outnumber the core opponents. And then the rest of the response in the survey, we term as swing. These are people who move around over the course of the survey, going from yes to no or undecided, uh, or they just sort of stay undecided throughout. So they're sort of, they're switching or not, move, they're not uh, totally committed in one way or the other. 
And if we go to the next slide, uh, you can just see, probably not a big surprise given what you've seen in this survey before, but the core supporters tend to be Democrats, they're liberal, uh, they're gonna be a little younger as well. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, the core opponents, primarily Republican and conservative uh, voters, they tend to be maybe a little older as well. And then in the middle, you can see, uh, you know, we saw earlier that Latinos and Spanish speakers in particular moved a lot in the survey. And you can see those groups uh, show up here as well as some other uh, types of voters. But that's sort of not a surprise. This is sort of what we tend to see in terms of these types of surveys. Okay. And I'll just finish up, do a quick concluding slide just to summarize. Um, you know, the survey, I think, overall shows there's a lot of concern about local schools. Uh, the issues facing uh, Tucson Unified School District are pretty con are quite concerning to the dis the respondents. They you know sort of aren't pleased with overall performance. But when we sort of speak specifically, uh, the lack of the shortage of qualified teachers, a lack of state funding for schools, and the quality of education are major problems identified by the community. Uh, and on par or even greater than concern about inflation and rising prices. That being said, the public sa says, yes, despite all these problems, and perhaps because of these problems, the district needs additional resources, additional funding to improve the, uh, education and address important issues like school safety. And as a result, we see in this survey uh, a pretty strong initial support for this proposed bond measure uh, particularly among Democrats, liberals, and white voters, uh, giving a, a lot large and intense backing for it, where, and as well as independents and Latinos, uh, majorities of those two groups also initially support it. And as you went through the presentation, you can see that support increases and intensifies as we give more information, explaining specific projects, how schools would be improved, and providing sort of the, the background, the community education program to sort of provide more substance of why the district is facing certain challenges, uh, why schools need upgrades, really sort of provides a, uh, a strong uh, foundation for why the public supports this idea. And that sort of leads to the final thought, which is, you know, a school bond makes sense to your pub, your voters. Initially, they support it. As they get more information, they continue to support it. And even in the face of some opposition uh, that argues it's really not appropriate for a bond, uh, they continue to support it at a relatively strong level. Uh, and so, you know, if the the district moves forward, it does seem to be something that the public is willing to support at this time. So I'll stop there. I'll hand it back to David, and he can. Uh, provide any additional information. Thanks, Rick. Um, I actually uh, don't know that I've got anything really to add to this. I think more, you know, if there are some questions uh, that we can answer related to this, I, I think we should probably jump right into that. Um, I guess I will pass it back to the board and see what you guys think. Uh, and so I'll turn over to Ms. Ekstrom for the first uh, question or comment. Uh, in the more than six in 10 voters support a $480 million bond, when you read them the statement, the yes and no votes, did they understand that that would um, in be an increase in taxes? This was a summary of the, the survey. It, within the context of the survey, we did identify that the if the bond measure is approved, the average resident would pay additional taxes. I'm off the top of my head, the exact dollar, maybe David, you remember the dollar number that we tested. Uh, I can pull that up. But yes, they they are told that. And not surprisingly, to a certain extent, it does bring support down a little bit. I think the more you mention the tax rate, people are going to be a little uh, concerned about it. But we also saw in the survey, which I did show you, is as you give them more information specifically, okay, here are the projects, the improvements uh, for the school district if this bond measure is passed, that sort of brings people back up in their willingness to support it. So 
as you get them information about what the use of the funds will be, they sort of come back to say, okay, I, I get it. It's, it's still important. Uh, but in a vacuum, that tax rate does, you know, move people a little, sort of makes them back off a little bit, but still well over 50% vote in favor uh, once they hear it. And I believe it was a annual rate of, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering exactly. I think it was $120, but maybe I'm misremembering. I, uh, I think it, I was remembering 126. So we're, we're close. We can like split the baby. We'll call it 123, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but I think we still had 60% voting in favor of the bond uh, when they heard that information. And, and then when you do your outreach and research, do you usually show that after community statements are made that there is a big upswing in support? Yes. I, and the sort of concept being, you know, the public needs to know why you would pursue this, what the sort of background is and the, you know, they support schools, you know, obviously in the survey, they think there are some issues that are concerning to them with local schools. Uh, and so there's a desire to invest in them. And I think the more information you provide them, the more likely they are to sort of say, okay, this is a, a, a reasonable and appropriate thing to, to pursue as they get more information. Uh, about what you want to do with potential bond funds. Uh, and, and then was there a, oh, okay, the race and ethnicity, um, I guess that there was other um, ethnic groups talked to or no? Uh, yeah, the survey uh, is representative of your community. Um, I showed uh, whites, Latinos, because uh, they're, in terms of population size of the voter sample, uh, they're the largest groups and statistically significant in terms of the data we have. But within the sort of scope of the survey, yes, we talked to African Americans, Native Americans, uh, people who identify with other ethnic and racial groups as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Exxon, for those questions. I'm going to add a question. So these, I think you mentioned in the beginning, these are likely voters in uh, off year city council races. So one of the things that we're, we're discussing, if we do approve this, again, this, isn't, this is only informational tonight. There's no action on this. Uh, it'll come back to us as an action probably on June 13th. Uh, it'll go on to the ballot potentially in November. So this, this is particularly looking at folks who have a history of voting in off-year, odd-year uh, city council and mayor races in the past. Is that correct? Correct. Was there any different? I know you didn't uh, survey this specifically, specifically but from, from your experience, experience on having worked, worked on bonds and other things in the past, uh, is, is there any difference in terms of homeowners uh, versus renters in terms of uh, kind of rationalizing the property tax and the implications for them and, and, and their vote? And how, do, how, do, how does that factor in um, to all this, especially for a bond that's focused just on property tax in terms of the mechanism yeah. uh, payments? We tend to see it's sort of a. a homeowners and renters and a lot of it's sort of two things one is renters tend to be younger um and homeowners tend to be older so there's sort of a you know multiple factors going on overall in this survey i think you know renters were more supportive than homeowners and that's often how it is um but i you know uh i think 60 percent of homeowners were supportive of the proposed bond and it was more like 70 percent among renters um, and similarly, younger voters in this survey were more supportive. You know, we say under if you're under the age of 50, you're more supportive than people who are over the age of 50 uh, in terms of looking at sort of splitting the electorate in half. Um, and that's sort of typical homeowners and older voters, maybe a little less supportive renters and younger voters, more supportive. Mr. Romero. So just uh, going back again to the beginning, so it looks like, like there, there was, was only 619 people that were uh, surveyed? Is that correct? Uh, that, that's the correct number, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I would have been um, thought that there would be a lot more uh, that we would do as far as that goes. It just sounds like a, a low number. Do you know how many percentage-wise were emails versus phone calls versus the other methods? Yeah, uh, I can, I mean, I can tell you the percentages of those, if you give me a little time, I would say in terms of this total sample size, uh, a sample of 600, it may not sound like a lot, but 
statistically, that's a pretty uh, typical sample size for a district of your size. Um, so it's, you know, I think we often do statewide surveys in Arizona as well. And sometimes we, you know, it's 600 to 800 for a statewide survey. So I know it may not seem like a lot, but it's from the perspective of what you get in terms of margin of error or sample, uh, they don't, re it doesn't really change all that much the more sample you add. If we had a 4.0 margin of error with 619, if we had gone up to 800, it would have been a 3.5 margin of error. So I know it may not seem like a lot, but statistically the value is of increasing the sample doesn't fundamentally change it in a big way. In terms of how the interviews were conducted, 47% uh, of the interviews were conducted via telephone interview. That's either on landline or cells, but frankly, it's virtually mostly uh, cell phones at this point. It was 78% of those people were on cell phones. Uh, and uh, in terms of email, 37% took the survey online and they received it, got the invitation via an email. Another 16% took it online and got the invitation via a text message. Okay, thank you. Dr. Shaw. I have this one around. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. This um, very enlightening and very thorough. Um, I guess my question is, I'll take it back, um, Mr. Romero, just a little bit. Um, what was the universe that you used to um, uh, gather the uh, the participants and um, I guess like what was your number? I When you say the universe, I, the way I interpret that is what you're asking is uh, the people who are likely to vote in this November 2023 20, election. That's, yes. that's who we were talking to. Uh, and so if you ask uh, the total number of people that we would anticipate, uh, is roughly just under 90,000 people participating, coming out and voting in November 2023. Uh, and that's based on them having cast the ballot uh, in one of the last three uh, off-year elections. So that's that's how we calculated it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Shaw. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mr. Sklarz, for the presentation. Um, I wonder, historically, how accurate are your poll results compared to what actually pans out in uh, local elections? I think it's, we feel pretty good about our survey results. I, I can't give you a specific number. I think what we've sort of said in the past to this is, Roughly, I think 95% of the districts that we work with where we would say this is a bond measure that has an opportunity to pass, they typically pass. That being said, the, you know, the surveys tend to be pretty accurate, but they are a snapshot in time. And that's sort of how we talk about it, that what happens in this survey in April of 2023 is how people are feeling today. Now, we're sitting here. And we all know that we're being told on June 1st, we're going to hit the debt ceiling. And everybody sort of is like, what does that mean? And so dramatic events like that, that impact the economy, that in fact, how people feel about, you know, taxes and spending, uh, that can that can impact a whole range of things. And so when there are big events that occur and they affect how people feel about, you know, issues related to taxes and spending or any type of issue um, that can dramatically change results. That being said, you know, sort of projecting out, barring those types of events, uh, we don't see any reason why these results pr should be fundamentally inaccurate given, you know, sort of the lay of the land right now. That's sort of the caveat I would give in terms of how to read these survey results, you know, roughly six months ahead of time. Yeah, and one thing I would add to this is just um, we, uh, Havelina, brought FM3 research into this because uh, this is a, a survey firm, survey research firm that is national, um, and they are absolutely one of the most respected in the entire country. 
uh, and they do, you know, so many school bond measures and overrides, uh, but they also do major national, you know, uh, corporate brand work and, uh, you know, political things. They, they're just a very um, active, very respected nationally firm. This is not a, a small outfit that you have working for you. Here, but you don't have any data as far as uh, your success rate uh, with your uh, survey results compared to the election results. I'm I'm sorry, the I was had a trouble hearing that question. Just I just want to confirm that there's no data in regards to the survey results and the election results and how they compare. You're I, you're sort of saying like how accurate is the sur how predictive is this survey of potential election day results? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Do you have a I mean, I I would say I, we feel confident about it. I guess I can only tell you sort of what I said before, which is I feel confident that this survey would accurately predict what happens on election day. If the election were tomorrow, I'd feel very confident. That being said, we're still, you know, six months from a potential election and a lot can happen, both good and bad. Uh, and that can fundamentally alter how people feel in ways that we don't even know right now. Um, it could be an external event that we have no control over, like a debt ceiling issue. It could be something internal that, you know, happens within the district that nobody foresaw happening, but occurs so it's just you know that is sort of the the unknown that you have with these types of things which is we know how people feel fundamentally today and barring major events i don't see why uh this survey should not be predictive come november but that is the caveat i give you now rick you um i if i heard the question right i i think uh, one of the things that the questioner was asking was really, is there data behind like, you know, the sort of the accuracy of your things? And you kind of alluded to one thing, and I don't know if there's data with it or if that you have that kind of information, but you alluded to that, you know, on 95% uh, of the um, places where you said this bond would pass, they passed. Um, so is that, can you is there any data that that you can kind of point to specifically related to that to address our question? Um, I mean, I think, you know, David, we've worked together on some other districts where I think, you know, whether, you know, can reference those where, uh, you know, the surveys have generally been in line with what happened. You know, we take a survey six months ahead of time and they are, you know, pretty accurate within a couple percentage points of what happens on Election Day. Um, so I would say, you know, I think based on these results, there seems to me about a 60, a sort of core group of about 60% of voters who say, we think the district needs money. There's a reason to invest in the district and we're willing to support this bond measure. And if that's sort of what the question is getting at, I think that sort of in reading this data, comes through to me, which is you have a core group of voters who are consistently sort of saying, I, I am concerned about the district. I think it needs more money. And this bond measure uh, addresses my concerns in a appropriate way. Yeah, I just want to, I guess, add that, um, I, you know, Havelina, we have literally the entire world of survey research firms to work with. Um, the reason we work with FM3 is because, you know, we want to deliver for our clients and they deliver for our clients. Literally, I, I'm pretty sure this is accurate that in that, you know, uh, in 10 years, probably roughly of us working together, uh, they haven't been wrong on any prediction that they've made. So I, I would stand behind the accuracy of this, you know, easily. And and I, I will just add that the, the sort of 95 percent number I referred to is your district with these results falls into that. We see a sort of landscape where the bond measure makes sense, where people support it and they under, they they grasp the need for it. Uh, and so we would say it, it's appropriate for your district. The districts that often, you know, 
sometimes there are, you know, districts that lose, but in the most part, the ones that tend to not do well on election day are those where things are sort of, you know, on a knife's edge in terms of, you know, they're more like 52% yes, or the numbers aren't as sort of clear that they're, it's a, it's a tighter race. So that's sort of how I would characterize this. Question is, is there anything that surprised you in the data you collected? I think the surprise to me, and I mentioned up front, was that some of the issues related to education are bigger concerns. They, they're ident- rated as higher, uh, more problematic than uh, inflation right now, which uh, is not something we're seeing. You know, uh, we do a lot of work, you know, you can see on the screen, we're based in California. Uh, we do a lot of work in California where homelessness, particularly in large urban cities, and I know it's also an issue in Arizona, is something that sort of is at the top of the list consistently and has been for several years. That wouldn't surprise me if that was if we had added that to the survey and that was a high level of concern. Um, but the fact that education, particularly teacher shortage and not enough funds for public schools in Arizona, uh, were slightly more than inflation was a bit of a surprise. Uh, I'd also say, you know, sort of the strength of agreement with a lot of the statements uh, that we tested suggests, you know, your needs and your priorities are really aligned with what matters to your public. Investing in, you know, making basic repairs to schools, addressing safety concerns, and then also just sort of fundamentally giving your students the education they need to be successful, whether it's, you know, going on to college or getting a, you know, jo- being job ready. Your goals are, and your residence goals and priorities seem to be closely aligned. Thank you, Ms. Do you have a question? No, okay. I'll- we still have time. I'll turn it over to Dr. Trujillo and Mr. Nodine. Uh, I know we have a one page here, kind of a very brief summary. So the goal tonight is to go over the survey results, talk about a very brief overview of what we're looking at. We have a bond committee that is finalizing some proposals. They'll come back to us on June 6th at our uh, study action, especially the study only meeting where we'll be looking at this and some details on what the proposal is. And they'll come back to us on June 13th for action. Uh, we do have a deadline to approve this, which is via our June 13th meeting, if it's going to be going on to the November ballot. Correct. So uh, what we've done here is I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Nodine. Is based off of the feedback that we saw uh, from the polling results. We put together a rough sketch of what the major expenditure categories would be and some rough language describing each expenditure, each expenditure category. We, have, we will be back here for the study session on June 6th where this will be in the form of a school by school, project by project format that would also be available for the public to look at as well. But for the purposes of now, uh, we certainly wanna do this uh, one pager to give the board and the community a flavor of what kind of expenditures we would seek to make. Mr. Nodine. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Uh, We looked at different categories. To some extent, these are determined by what your needs are. Um, But what we did is we took the survey information and uh, wanted to work these to see how we could uh, educate the community and get the community support through the way we present the bond. Um, Because it's clear in the survey that um, education and information out to the public did make uh, a change in in how people voted by about 20%. So um, we put these different categories, there's five different categories, we put them in order of what seemed to be the preference from the surveys. And I, I wanna say this is very preliminary because as, as Dr. Shaw mentioned, it, it does go through uh, the bond exploratory committee uh, and uh, we'll come back to you as a draft for comment and revision. Um, but we put them in the order that it appeared to be from the survey uh, that we would uh, kind of their level of support in the community. Uh, and so that would be repairs and renovations to start with. And that's really looking at outdated failing systems, deteriorating roofs, deteriorating schools, and getting those things fixed. It also goes beyond that to look at how schools, surfaces, and so on can be renovated, uh, walls, uh, floors, and so on. 
and also furnishings and equipment to really bring schools into uh, good uh, environments, uh, pleasant environments, attractive environments for students and teachers. Um, it also included outside areas too, uh, which would be fields, parking lots, and so on. Um, and you've been through the schools, so you know what they look like, you know what some of the parking lots look like, they need to work. Um, the next one is learning space improvements. Uh, and this, the objective of this is to look at uh, preparing students for uh, college or careers. Um, and so what we wanted to do was uh, cr create things like learning labs, science labs, improve those. Um, because studies have shown that in a good space, a student is more engaged, and actually teachers are more engaged. Um, the other thing is uh, we wanted to replace uh, portables uh, with permanent buildings where it was appropriate, places like uh, UHS. Uh, we wanted to look at portables or permanent buildings where we may uh, look at K-6 uh, conversions, K-5 to K-6. Um, and then another thing was looking at middle schools and the learning lab approach and adding learning labs to middle schools. So those are some of the things that are in learning space improvements and they're called out specifically because they're geared toward uh, that specific goal on education, not just a general better space goal. Uh, and then the next thing is health and safety. Um, because surveys of the community have always shown that health and safety is one of the top things. Um, so this one includes what you would expect, security, uh, fire alarms, access control, and all of those types of things uh, to help the schools uh, be safe in terms of uh, potential threats. And then the other side of it is um, looking at health and health services and how we can improve um, health offices in the schools and, and give them equipment that they need to monitor and protect students' uh, health. The next thing is technology. And in technology, um, really we're looking at upgrading, uh, continuing our one-to-one -one program, uh, making sure that we have the appropriate level of uh, of system of devices for the students and the grades that they're in uh, and making sure they all have access to them not only devices but also the finishing up the work we've already started on getting active panels and, and things like that into the classrooms to really uh, improve the educational environment and then um, the final one is student transportation and support vehicles and that one is looking like repairs and, and renovation taking care of the ones that are uh, at the end of their useful life. Um, and then uh, providing, making sure that we get modern ones that are fuel efficient, have air conditioning, uh, and are safe for our students and staff. And so those are the five categories uh, that we're proposing at this point. As I said, and as uh, uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned, uh, we're gonna take this back to the Bond Exploratory Committee on, uh, five, uh, on May 30th. Uh, to get their feedback on it uh, and compare it more to the surveys. Uh, things may shift around a little bit. You'll see it as a draft with, along with the financials, uh, along with um, uh, the fiscal information and along with the specific bond program and the numbers put alongside these categories uh, on the 6th as a draft and then the final will be available to you on the 13th um, should you decide to call the election. Thank you, Mr. Nodin. We're spending a lot of time on this topic tonight, and we will continue to spend a lot of time on it for the next two meetings, and I'll probably say this three times. I think I truly believe that uh, this decision that we make may be the most consequential of our career as governing board members uh, in terms of the investment uh, that we're asking our community to make uh, for each and every one of our 89 uh, schools and campuses uh, that we have throughout TUSD. Uh, so I, I think it's definitely worth the time we're spending and uh, the conversations that we're having uh, here with our community, uh, with our consultants and our bond exploratory committee. Uh, so thank you everyone for all the work that you're doing. And so uh, any last questions or comments from our governing board member? All right, thank you very much, uh, Havalina uh, and R3 and to our staff on this really important topic. Uh, this will be coming back to us in two weeks and in a uh, final vote whether or not we will call for an election uh, on June 13th.
Uh, next on our agenda is another very important uh, work that we'll be doing as governing board members uh, this year and, and this term, uh, which is our code of conduct. Again, this is a study item only. This isn't an action item. This is to review uh, the process so far and all of the data that came into our code of conduct uh, and to review some initial proposals uh, that our code of conduct committee uh, has put together. And before I turn it over to Dr. Trujillo and Ms. Warren Brandis, uh, to all of our committee members for the Bond Exploratory Committee, for our Code of Conduct Committee, and to all the other committees that we have as a school district, thank you so much for all of the time and energy and effort you put into this work. It's making such consequential decisions and, and important uh, work for the future of our district. So thank you, everyone out there listening who are part of these committees. Dr. Trujillo, Ms. Warren Brand. Yes, President Shaw, members of the governing board, I think equally as consequential as a potential bond is a, um, a change to the code of conduct, which promises to set a new tone, culture and climate of safety and accountability and responsibility and empowerment for teachers, uh, as well as our administrators across the district. Leading that work is our director for student relations, uh, Anna Warmbrand will take us through tonight, which will be the actual first public unveiling of formal recommendations, albeit at a very high level. I just uh, I wanna give a quick word to the public. On June 6th, uh, the governing board will actually see the actual red line version of the code of conduct. That will also be available for the public as an attachment as part of the June 6th materials. You'll be able to follow along uh, with the red line code of conduct along with our board members as they study the item that night. Okay, take it away, Ms. Warmbrand. Good evening, Board President Dr. Shaw, esteemed school board members, Dr. Trujillo, head legal counsel, Mr. Ross. Good evening, this is an exciting evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is our first look at the revisions that all of our stakeholders have spoken to and what our internal steering committee has worked on. It is important that we revise our code of conduct. It benefits our students here in Tucson Unified School District and we want to create a document where all stakeholders have had input in the revisions of the code of conduct. Again, this is our internal steering committee that worked to collect stakeholder input, analyze stakeholder input, and craft revisions within this document. You can see you have TEA represented, you have Eli represented, you have voices of equity from um, our lead, Dr. Kanasha Brown. We have our voices of lawyer voices. We like lawyer voices, we have parent voices, and um, we have classified voices as well. And I was a facilitator, not a voter on this committee piece in part. And we did have one district representative, Brian Lambert. 9,642 stakeholder voices. So we got very close to that 10,000 had we not needed to move along to get this piece in part to you in an appropriate time frame for a vote. We would have hit that 10,000, no doubt. But um, we have 1,834 student voices. We have 4,452 staff voices. And we have 3,356 parent voices represented. These are the schools in which student voices were heard, all of your high schools and half of your middle schools. And we extended the invitation to many, many more schools as well. We had many department forums. These are some of the important folks that we met with. And many other folks were represented at our 12 code of conduct community forums, including some of those more individualized pieces and parts. We did have in-person. Our virtual forums were much more successful. And this information uh, is stuff that you've already seen. You've seen this information. So that's why I'm going through the deck a little bit faster. OK, recommended revision number one. Let's get to the good stuff. This revision you've seen before. This is sat consistently um, within our stakeholder input that our code of conduct be split into three different sections. A section for elementary students, a section for middle school students, and a section for high school students. Recommended revision number two. We would like to consider 
the extension of the time students can be enrolled in DAPE. If that requires a separate PIA, then that's fine. We can do a separate PIA that doesn't touch this code of conduct, but I will tell you that stakeholders and the internal steering committee have asked for more flexibility for students as they are long-term suspended to participate in the DAPE program. We would like to add some specific language in the violation description related to audiovisual recording, which is a level two offense, to include audiovisual and photographs on school campuses, and that be added to our telecommunication device or other technology level two offense. And you'll see in the red line copy what that language will look like on June 6th. In the spirit of expanding alternative education options for all learners, we would like to be able to include TUVA as a recommendation from a, one of our hearing officers at the discretion as an alternative to their current educational environment. It is common practice throughout the state to have an alternative to suspension program or pieces and parts. And um, particularly for our younger learners, parents requested, listen, I know this may not be working out, I'd really like to enroll in TUVA. And sometimes if they've had um, offenses that require long-term suspension, we don't have options like DAPE for them. But to be able for a hearing officer to say, you know what, your alternative to suspension is we will allow you to enroll in TUVA, will increase the opportunity for our students to get a high quality education, not on the campus in which they are having challenges. And this has been utilized um, once or twice, but the pieces and parts that we have to go through, because it is not a standardized practice within what we do for our students, um, if we could remove those barriers to allow that to be an option, I think that would benefit our student population. And that could extend to, um, say, Project More, any alternative education op options. We wanna keep our kids in our schools as much as possible. Recommended revision number five. It has its own category. Um, and so I wanted to speak to the defiance and disrespect piece as it sits now. You'll see it much clearer in your red line piece. Currently, it's a level two offense with the option if behavior is ongoing and escalating and documented to request an elevation of discipline for disrespect and defiance to a staff member. Stakeholders have asked that defiance and disrespect to staff, not to peers, have consequences that can include in and out of school suspension without having a request, request to elevate discipline. In addition, stakeholders have asked that the description for defiance and disrespect be very specific. And so, the request, and this is why it's standalone, is that currently it sits at a level two offense, that it is moved to a level three offense throughout the code of conduct, whether you are elementary, middle, or high school, and that the definition, which has been worked through with committee input, and is mirrors very common language for other school districts that they use for defiance and disrespect as well. So, and this is a piece in part that many folks have asked for, as I stated before. So defiance and disrespect, defiance. Engaging in socially rude interactions in which there's disrespect and resistance to a staff member's directive or request. Disrespect, engaging in intentional behavior with staff that insults one's race, appearance, professionalism, general insults, insults that involve curse words, throwing objects at the staff member, destroying classroom property belonging to the staff member. And these are all pieces and parts um, that we've seen consistently in requests to elevate discipline from our administrative team, as well as comments that we've received um, in a large part from staff as well. So this is, this is our recommended revision number five. For our elementary students, our revisions look a little bit different. And part of that is you will see in our middle and high schools that there's a progression of offenses. For our elementary students, we hold under a K-4 law 
throughout the state of Arizona that does not allow flexibility and progression. That actually sets the standards for what we can and cannot suspend for students in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade up to the age of 10, depending on their birth date. So you will not see a progression. What you will see instead is some changes of levels within the recommended revisions for elementary school. And when we have the completed code of conduct, if you approve the revision to break the code of conduct into sections, we will have a clear description coming from our legal counsel of the K-4 law in, that code, in the code of conduct for that section. So what our elementary revisions are recommended is that for our attendance policy violations, that tardies, unexcused absences, and truancies are removed from that piece in part. They do not feel that elementary students are responsible and should be punished for not being able to get to school, for having their absences called in, and for being tardy in the morning. Uh, our elementary um, folks feel that that is an adult issue for our youngest learners and that those, sh those pieces and parts should be removed. For drug use and alcohol use, possession, not sale, they would like to move that from a level four to a level three which is a one to 10 day suspension. And there's not a progression level. Right now, if an elementary student is in possession or use of drugs, then we have to look at a potential for a long-term hearing. There's not an alternative school for our youngest learners to go. So oftentimes what will happen is our school administrators will issue a couple of days of suspension for use if they're able to under the K-4 law, and then hold the rest of those days in an abeyance. So that practice wouldn't change except for the piece and part of potentially requiring a long-term hearing as we cannot suspend our youngest learners past the point they would qualify for Dave anyhow because there isn't an alternative for them to go to. Hence, going back to that second revision number two. So. If we had robust alternatives for our learners, then that impacts, of course, how we make our decisions of what happens when things go wrong for our kiddos. Illicit drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and other violations, possession or use level two to level three. So for alcohol and tobacco, currently they're a level two. Um, that does not carry any exclusionary piece and part unless there's a quest for elevation for discipline. And so they would like to even out for our elementary learners that our drug offenses, our alcohol offenses, and our tobacco offenses all sit at a level three, which if they meet the requirements of the K-4 law, could have exclusionary practice as an option one to 10 days. They would also, for the first offense for sale and sharing of drugs for our elementary learners, they would like to move that level four to a level three, but for the first offense. The second offense, then they would like to do requests for elevation of discipline. And that may be submitted by the site administrator. And that's the same practice we have now. Um, we just highlighted for the second offense, also in green, just so you knew that that's, that's what we do now and that piece in part if this was to sit at a level three offense. That allows some flexibility for your elementary administrators to make choices individualized for the student without having to look at a level four consequence, which is um, 11 to 30 days right now in the code of conduct. And so our stakeholders also state that there needs to be more options for our younger learners and 11 to 30 days for drug use or even sale at an elementary school level is not something overall that our stakeholders supported. Absolutely, suspension, but without giving students an option past that 10 days, we feel like we're doing a disservice. And when I say we, I mean the committee. Again, I'm not a voting member. Okay. Middle school, now you're gonna see our middle school and high school, they look at multiple offenses and the progression of that. And they really took to heart our initial work 
where we looked at many different codes of conducts throughout the state. And when I came to this board the last time, um, we talked about the variability factors. And so I wanted to address that as we look at the progression of these offenses, this really limits the variability of how administrators can issue exclusionary consequence and suspension pieces and parts because it locks in the amount of days that you can issue a consequence and what those are. So no longer for our middle and high school learners would you just have, well, this is the offense, it's one to 10 days. And at one school, children get six, and at another school they get two. So that variability piece um, will definitely decrease with these level offenses progression. So when we say a, a prog it has to be a progression of the same violation, so let's say, for example, um, you have a parking violation. This is a level one offense that isn't changing. Nobody is bringing a revision to you for parking violations. It's a typical level one offense. So let's say you have your first offense. For our middle school learners, it's a student conference, which can include that parent contact. For our second, third, and fourth offenses, you can issue a detention. If that's not working out, you can have a day of in-school suspension. And if you remember from those color graphs, ISS was an option that our stakeholders wanted to utilize more frequently for a level one and two offenses versus requests of elevation to discipline for out-of-school suspension. We are also gonna ask that there's multi-tiered systems of support, that there's a referral to the MTSS coordinator with that third offense, and there's a parent conference to develop a behavioral contract and then if you get to a fifth offense within level one, as in you continue to have parking violations up to five, then you can fill out a request to elevate discipline to level two. Level two offenses. And you'll see in yellow, these are the current level two offenses. There is no recommendation for revision for these, for these pieces and parts. Contraband, combustibles, disruption, gambling, dishonesty, improper use of technology, petty theft, minor aggressive act. So there aren't any revisions to those pieces and parts. Those would say at a level two. So let's say that at the tender age of 12, you have, you're, you're acquiring a bit of a gambling problem. Well, the first time that happens, you will get a detention. That is your first offense. The second time that happens, you may get one, two, or three days of in-school suspension you will have a parent conference to develop a behavior contract. You will have an MTSS referral and a counselor referral for two, three, and four offenses. Now, let's say you have a first offense, which is gambling. You're gonna get some lunch detention. And then a couple days later, you decide you're gonna take uh, one of your friend's uh, pencil boxes. Not worth $150, but definitely petty theft. And you take it, and you steal it, and you get caught. That is not a second offense because it's not the same violation. You would get another lunch detention. Now, three weeks later, you decide to gamble again. Now you have a second offense. Now, if you continue your petty theft, then your next violation would be ISI. So that's the intention behind the progression. It's not just a blanket. Any level two offense you have, and then the second one, you get in school suspension, and then you do another level two, and you get a third. It doesn't progress in that manner. It's very specific to the actual offense within the violation chart. And again, when you see the red line copy, you'll see exactly how that would look. The only, and so this is the next part, and you'll see this in our middle and high school, that they're in addition to recommending revision which is a progression chart. So the other part is that there are certain pieces and parts in the code that we, they're gonna request to either raise a level or, or decrease a level within the code. So the first one for middle school is they are hoping that they can move verbal provocation, which is level one right now, to a level two offense. Um, we have found that verbal provocation is the beginning of most aggression in this district. It starts with a verbal back and forth. 
And at a level one offense, oftentimes what can happen is one student can have a verbal, an instance of verbal provocation and a whole thing, a whole fight, a whole disruption on campus of a violent nature happens, an assault, and that student sits at a level one consequences is mostly intervention based and the other students have much harsher level four consequences. So they're hoping to be able to have verbal provocation as a level two for middle school. That is the only change for middle school for level one and two offenses. All of the rest of the offenses would stay at their current levels. Only the progression chart for level one and two is what's different. For level three offenses, for the first offense, you would have one to three days OSS or ISS or a combination. For a second offense, you would have three to five days. For a third offense, you would have five to 10. And if you have a fourth offense, then you can do a request to elevate to a level four. And so offenses that are not changing and there's no revision being asked for is bullying, harassment, threats and intimidation, sexual harassment, other aggression, endangerment. Those would still stay at level three offenses. And parent conference, you can see, runs throughout as well. So this is the recommendation for middle school for level three offenses. They would like to move fighting from a level four to a level three offense. Currently, level four offenses, you have your first fight, and if you agree to restore to practice, then you may come back after one day. That is what the Code of Conduct says now. If you have a second fight at a level four, then you are suspended for three days out of school if you agree to a mediation, and then you have seven days held in an abeyance. What middle school is asking is that fights sit at this progression, where your first fight you have one, two, or three days out of school suspension. Your second fight, three to five. Your third, you could have five to 10 days. And this is a combination of OSS, ISS. And then if you have more than three fights, then you will be at a level four, which you will see is a long-term hearing in 11 to 30 days. Um, there's a lot of variability in what people call fights. And this means that if folks still feel like the child only should be out one day for their first offense, it's the same as it is now, absolutely. And it could be in-house now, which is something in the code of conduct isn't an option for that piece in part unless they do a waiver to waiver down. So for middle school, they felt that this is an appropriate progression to keep their campuses safe. Illicit drugs level four to level three because they believe in this progression for middle school students. Um, taking middle school students for a first offense to a long-term hearing or a second or a third is not something that our middle school folks felt comfortable of. That's not what our stakeholders said for middle school as well. Um, they're still learning how to handle their pieces and parts. Again, for drug offenses currently, although they sit at a level four, you only have one day out of school if you agree to a drug awareness class. Now, the piece in part is our student stakeholders are very clear. Those drug awareness classes have not prevented their friends from doing drugs. So essentially, they're using drugs on campus. They agree to a class. They take the class. They're back the very next day. When you have a second drug offense, it's the same as fights. You can be out for three days with seven held in abeyance. You take another drug awareness class. We are not seeing that that piece in part within our current code of conduct is stopping repeat offenders or drug use on campus. And the students have said, you need to do a better job at keeping our bathrooms and our campuses safe. And you need to do a better job with educating us for drugs and supports as well. So I will talk to the intervention and support piece at the very end, because it's not an or. Nothing in what the, re the revisions for this code of conduct are speak to, we'll offer you an intervention, and if you agree to it, you get less suspension. It will be a non-negotiable in the code of conduct. 
that people are supported, kids are supported, and staff, and we have those pieces and parts. And you'll see how that sits when you see the red line. So this is, this is simply the revision to consequence. Um, this is not all the pieces and parts of intervention. We didn't revise that, but we are going to ask that it sits required to be offered to families 100% of the time. Tobacco and alcohol use possession. Currently, it sits at a level two. So what happens, and I spoke to this just a little bit the last time we met, is that kids are smoking, vape, tobacco vape, and oftentimes marijuana at the same time, but definitely tobacco vape and using alcohol. And there's no in-school suspension option. There's no out-of-school suspension pieces and parts. Um, it's a lunch detention. And we have found that that does not actually prohibit kids from smoking or drinking alcohol on campus very effectively. Not to say that everyone is for long-term suspension exclusionary practice. Again, this is the progression level. Literally, this could carry one day of in-school suspension for a first offense, three days for a second offense, and so on. For level four offenses, it hasn't changed that piece in part. That's 11 to 30 days is the option. But we would like to be able to provide the administrators the flexibility to hold days in abeyance as they see fit within that piece in part. Not less than the 11 days, but currently um, they have to go through the district piece in part to say, hey, I don't want to take this kid to a long-term hearing. I know this is a level four offense. It's very serious. This is my investigation. Can we have you know four days out and the rest of those 11 held in abeyance? Absolutely. So our secondary folks are asking that they have that flexibility to do so because having to take kids to a long-term hearing, we want to avoid that piece in part. We don't want to long-term suspend kids out from the district. So this piece in part doesn't change except for the flexibility for a bans. And our middle school and our high school also has this re recommended revision that simulated firearms move from a level three to a level four. And it, this isn't the dangerous items piece because there's dangerous items that are, you know, laser pointers and BB guns and water guns and things that are very obviously not real. We're talking about the items that come on our campus that literally law enforcement initially is not sure if it's a real firearm or not. And within the code of conduct, it's very specific what those are. And so currently it sits at a level three. We have had enough events, you know, this past year where people are not sure until law enforcement literally disarms the weapon, whether it's a real gun or a simulated firearm. And so our secondary folks and parents are, are very much in line in staff with this as well. Um, this is not a joke. This is not something we're playing around with. It scares our communities as much as if it was a live gun in that moment and the repercussions, aside from the obvious death piece, not to be blunt, is the same in terms of communication and counseling those pieces and parts. And, and it's, it's really a scary situation. So this is, this is one that our stakeholders have been very vocal about. For high school, current level one offenses that, are, that we do not have recommended revisions for, recklessness, um, attendance violations, dress code, parking violations, and public displays of affection, um, although truancy is addressed, and we'll get to that piece in part. So for our first offense is a student conference, which can include parent contact. So we say can because when you are 16 years old and you are having a public display of affection, an administrator would like the option to simply tell that child to stop. Hey, guys, come on. You're in public. Cool out. That doesn't necessarily always require their parent to be called at a level one offense. If they continue to do so, 
then they may have to serve some detention unless the administrator decides to waiver down. One day of in-school suspension, um, and then any consequence from level one, two, or three, and a mandatory MTSS plan, because that means that this child is struggling with some minor pieces and parts, and a plan and some parent contact needs to be in order. And if those pieces and parts are in place, we find that oftentimes then you don't have more offenses. Things do not always escalate. And we haven't always done the best job in ensuring that these multi-tiered systems of supports are in place as quickly as they can be for students for these minor infractions. And you will see once you get to level five, it escalates to the next level of offenses for our high school um, progression. And you will see that they don't have changes within our level one yet. So for level two offenses, um, contraband, and this is the same list as middle school, gambling, those pieces and parts remain at these levels. For a level one offense, we have detention. For a level two offense, you have the option of in-school suspension, one to two days. Offense number three, in-school suspension, two to three days. Offense number four can include any of those pieces and parts and a contract and a multi-tiered systems of support document. And then if these behaviors continue, then they can do a request to elevate discipline to a level three. So level two offenses that they would like the board to look at for some recommended revisions. Um, verbal provocation, again, they'd like to have that move to a level two. And attendance policy violations. So this is the truancy piece, but it's not the truancy of wandering around campus. That can remain at a level one piece in part. There's detention, there's some options of in school, there's no out of school suspension for that piece in part. Um, but it's the leaving campus without permission piece that they would like to elevate from level one to level two. So. You can see there, there is no out of school suspension at level two either. These are our kids on campus with the opportunity to learn with their teachers, with whatever counseling they may need. If they are wanting to leave campus so badly, then they, we need some time to be with them to figure that piece and part out. So this is not a request to elevate for the kids who are tardy to class, who are wandering around, those pieces and parts. This is for kids who are consistently leaving campus. Other violations of school policy, parking lot violations. At our high schools, um, many things can happen in parking lots that are reckless and dangerous to the people in those parking lots. And being able to have uh, level two consequences is something that was very important for our high school communities. Level three offenses. We have a combination of ISS or OSS, one to three days. Second offense, three to five. Third offense, five to nine. And fourth offense would be an elevation to a level four. And our current level three offenses would include, if the board so chooses, the defiance and disrespect piece, along with bullying, harassment, threats and intimidation, all of the pieces and parts that sit in the sexual harassment pieces that are still level three which is sexual harassment without contact um, and pornography. Other aggression would still sit at a level three and endangerment would also sit at a level three still. And that's consistent with what's in the code of conduct now. Here are some changes that high school recommends for level three offenses. They don't want to have aggression change from a level three, but they would like skateboarding taken off um, we're not trying to out of school suspend repeatedly kids for skateboard use, but currently right now it sits in aggression and um, that has not been helpful for our learners to have to be suspended for skateboarding. So they just like to have that taken off. Um, alcohol, tobacco and other violations, they have asked that it move from a level two to a level three for use. Trespassing, vandalism and criminal damage, um, and I will say that when I met with facilities and operations, this one is the piece and part 
with our custodial team and our maintenance team that sat really heavy with them is the vandalism, graffiti, and tagging. And they asked, please, 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 can there be more recourse for what happens there? Because the amount of time that we take in those spaces is significant. So in addition to voices we've heard from other staff groups, that one was one they said, when you go to the board, please let them know that's our biggest concern. So I said, I promise you I will. So they would like to move that from a level two to a level three offense. And they would like to move fighting from a level four down to level three. And again, this is what the level three piece and part is. And that mirrors the request from middle school as well. Level four offenses sit the same as the middle school recommendation, um, where they have some flexibility for abeyance. Um, but that, again, a level mm -hmm. four offense, these are, you know, arson, assault, indecent exposure, fire alarm misuse, verbal school threats, robbery. These are the pieces and parts that we do, um, as a community have stated, we would like to have that child participate in a hearing to make some choices for long-term suspension. Um, but in some instances, we would like to also be able to have the option to hold some of those days in advance so we're not going to a long-term hearing. And so that, that is that piece in part. And then simulated firearms, again, was requested from high school, the same as middle school, to be made a level four. And that is the revision piece in part that we came up with. Well, thank you, Ms. Warren Brand, for that very detailed presentation. Um, I would say very clear. Well, yeah, this is, this is really clear. This really helps highlight all the work that's been going on in the last six months or so. Thank you. Governing board members, any questions, comments, feedback as we get into the last weeks of this work? Now, again, that's, that's a misstatement. It's not the last weeks because then the work really starts in terms of educating everyone and implementing yes. any changes that are made. So the work will definitely continue, but at least in terms of the oh, yes. revision of the code of conduct and that work. Mr. Romero, please go ahead. So. Um, from the first time this was brought up, um, you've done a lot, a lot of work. I'm um, extremely grateful to you. Thank you. Um, and then all the teams that you guys put together, a lot of uh, people that are somewhere in this room that have been working on this. Um, thank you for all your hard work. Thanks for talking, um, getting input from the community. I think this is going to be huge uh, for our district. Um, but you're doing all the, the work that needs to be done so we can make a good board decision for our school. So we appreciate you guys very much. Thank you, it's a wonderful team. The committee's been fantastic. Um, district leadership in removing barriers for us to be able to have access to all of our operations teams, all of our equity voices, all of those pieces and parts, and of course my department with those <laughs> amount of schools we all went to. It's been, it's been amazing, actually. Thank you. Ms. Luna Rose. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Ms. Warman, thank you so much for the presentation. I just wanted to echo um, Mr. Romero. Um, I really appreciate all the work. I knew I see some of the, in the audience, those who are on the committee. Yes. Um, and I know that it's, it's a lot of time has been spent. So this is definitely, um, for lack of a better word, a labor of love, yes. I can tell. Um, and you know, I've had parents reach out to me about you know, that they participated or they missed it mm -hmm. um, and, and were hoping to give mm -hmm. their thoughts to me. So I see some of the things that I've been told personally have are reflected here. Yes. And so I wanted to appreciate the, the mm -hmm. good work you're doing. And um, just as a, a little aside to take off skateboarding, just reminds me of the sticker that said skateboarding is not a crime. Yep. So <laughs> um, just wanted to throw that out there. I'm a 90s kid. <laughs> me too. I have it in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lona Rose. Ms. Shaw. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, and thank you, Ms. Warren Brand, for all thank your you. work. Um, I have a few questions, maybe a comment even. Um, so I saw in several of the slides for like uh, specifically level one, level two in middle school, I think I even saw it in high school and also elementary, maybe. But um, like those, level one and level twos and sometimes level three, or excuse me, offense one, offense two, mm -hmm. they didn't always include parent contact. Mm -hmm. And so for some of these offenses, although they're minor for like mm -hmm. a, uh, a level one offense, 
uh, there's it's an option to to tell the parent because this is crazy to me because if my daughter is acting out I want to know about it so I could uh, you know check her behavior and so is this for for is it always an option for some of these like first second no. and third offenses or no that piece in part isn't part of the revision process for our elementary and middle school learners that's standard practice so that wouldn't change and I agree with you if something happens with my boys and you don't call me what are we doing so that that piece in part is not a revision that that would still stand in practice for our administrators and and I actually request a 24-hour turnaround if not same day that's my preference absolutely so that's it's not on some of these slides because it's already like standardized for our younger learners and for the high school they ask for some flexibility pieces for our older learners for those smaller offenses because they felt it was important that they are given the opportunity to make the right choice before their guardian is contacted for those smaller offenses. But you'll see when you come to the suspension pieces and parts, it says parent contact in each of those. So that's just that. So for high school, for at least the first ones, folks wanted to have the opportunity to help solve it with the learner. But for our elementary and middle, um, we didn't include it because it's standard practice for their, our youngest learners. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um... And then, let's see, where was I going to go? Um, I'll, I'll open it up to others. Ms. Ekstrom, go ahead. Hi, again, thank you okay. for your work and for the committee's work. Um, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, for elementary, I understand that um, you know there are certain things that we can't do. But as far as escalation goes, um, how do we address that? So, um, Mr. Ross, would you mind just sharing with them just the parameters of the K-4 law? I think that will help as to when folks can request an elevation for discipline or not. Good evening. Um, boy, that, I could probably spend as much time on that K-4 law as Anna has spent on all these revisions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite complex. Um, in fact, you know, as she mentioned, we're going to be um, putting, trying to put something in the code of conduct to, to describe that. It's there. It, it's a flow chart with like four levels to it for K four, and I don't know if you want me to get into great detail about. It. Like I said, I could probably spend 20, 25 minutes on it, um, but basically, you there. There's some big offenses that you can suspend and expel for. You know, guns, drugs. Um, you know serious injury to people. But beyond that, you have to go through several levels of interventions. You have to meet criteria uh, for aggravating circumstances, the statute calls it. Um, you have to have gone through you know, a whole period of, of attempts at, at addressing the behavior before you can get to that level of elevation. So it's a lot of documentation that's going to have to occur. It's not impossible to do. Um, but it is it is quite um, quite demanding uh, to to document all of that before you can get to the point where you can again suspend. That doesn't mean that there aren't other tools in the toolbox um, to address behavior. And you know, as you're doing using those tools, you're probably building up that record to get to you know the the level where you can now suspend a student. But we're talking about even for a day, you know. That you have to go through all of this in order to do that and that's a lot um, when maybe a kid you know in the previous before this law was there maybe a day would have been the, the right thing for that student now you can't do that until you you've met all of these and i'll be happy to go through that maybe when when the board considers the um, code of conduct that might be a time to to have a, a kind of a briefing on the k-4 law that would be helpful thank you um how long will the red lines be posted for people to be able to make comments? So we're on a, um, uh, board member Exxon, we're on an aggressive timeline to have those ready by the end of the month so that we can have them up, distributed to board members by June 1 and have them up available for the public uh, at least for 13 days. So when you, that way the public will at least have had 13 days to look at it 
before you convene on the 13th for a possible vote. So then we will utilize email and text messaging to let parents know that this is what's going to be changed. Similar to uh, what we do with uh, public comment for a policy, when you send it out to a first read, that's what I envision for once we get the red line up and running, is use that same mechanism where we put it out uh, and just invite everybody to look at it, maybe collect comments. We have the same structure for the PIA, which I also want to remind the public and the board that a parallel document that has to go up is the performance impact analysis uh, that goes along with these revisions uh, that the board did commit to uh, as part of our post-unitary status plan. Any major changes to the unitary status plan uh, that we were under court supervision, which this is probably the most significant change that you have made so far out of court supervision is the overhaul of the uh, code of conduct that necessitates the PIA process, which I know, Anna, that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of those documents um, are just about done, but tomorrow, with a nice good cup of coffee, I'm gonna go through it with a fine tooth comb before I send it on. But those are, those are just about done. I just need one more look before they make their way out of, out of my office. And then the use of cell phones, um, is that in here under another wording or like a disruptive behavior perhaps? Disruption does okay. oftentimes, um, cell phones can fit under disruption. I will tell you that um, there is a portion of staff did, that brought up cell phone concerns. Overall, however, from our stakeholders, um, from parents and from students, that was not echoed in a piece in part that there should be a revision for. Okay. There was a portion of staff that wanted stricter cell phone rules, but they did not speak for the majority voice for exclusionary practice, and that's why you see it didn't change a level. There's not a, there's not a touch point to it. Um, and, and that actually goes under telecommunication misuse, and it's a level two offense so it just there wasn't enough voices that said this is the most important piece in part and so we didn't change it and then we talk a lot about equity so are we going to be looking at violations in each school to see how um how equitable it is across you know the regions and how we will be addressing that yes and in fact um every week I provide a report for risk ratios, for disproportionality for all of our ethnicities. I provide that to Dr. Kanasha Brown and I provide that to our directors of equity. And I know that as we went through this process and I met with those departments, um, their voices and concerns were loud and clear in terms of the variability of how kids are suspended and how exclusionary practice is used, and I will tell you that the defiance and disrespect piece came up um, as this is why we have a very clear definition, because when we did not, then what someone could interpret as defiant or disrespectful can be different from what someone else interprets. So what we tried to do with these revisions is eliminate those concerns, but that piece in part and the reports that we give um, not only will continue in that space, but we are actually developing deeper reports now. Um, I just met with our Synergy team last week, and uh, David Scott is gonna start working on more detailed suspension reports that we can order through long periods of spans and times for every single school site for ethnicity. And so the longer I'm in this position, the more data-driven I become to make decisions for our students, the more reports I ask the Synergy team to generate that I can share with our, our directors in the equity space so that we can work as a team to triage the supports and the advocacy that's needed. Um, and so I heard that piece in part loud and clear and, and having housed an EDI for this year, um, those are my wonderful colleagues. And, and with Dr. Schroeser coming aboard, she's already starting to transition, and so we're working together to get the report she needs right away as well with Dr. Kanasha Brown, yes. So then if we see huge, um, huge data inequities, how will that be addressed, Dr. Trujillo? Uh, board Member Ekstrom, we have a longstanding structure 
as part of the unitary status plan uh, that student relations leads where we don't like to use the term remediation, we use the term support plan where because of the disciplinary reports that are submitted on a monthly basis, Anna and her team are able to screen for disparities, uh, more pronounced instances of exclusionary discipline uh, on, on campuses. Then we're able to visit those teams and we're able to do audits, we're able to do reports, we're able to review suspensions. Um, and then we're able to actually visit. I know Anna's incredibly active in getting out to a lot of those schools. We've always had that structure because under the under court supervision, we used to have to turn in uh, actually monthly discipline reports to the Department of Justice. So we had a, every single suspension uh, had to be verified. So we, we keep that structure. Uh, that way we can make sure that we minimize, if not eliminate any of the disparities. I will say that um, when we bring this back, uh, I think there we have to take into consideration that there's a significant amount of training. You heard Anna talk about just providing clarity on, on what it means, disrespect, defiance of authority. I think we're gonna have to do the same thing with things like tardiness. Like not all tardiness is equal, okay? so. I was a high school administrator and teacher for many years. There's legitimate first period tardiness issues if you have transportation problems and you're late to first period. That is way different than the 14 or 15 year old that walks in late to first period, second period, third period, and fourth period and is disruptive. One is a behavior issue that needs accountability. The other one is more of a resource problem. We need to look at access and helping with bus. So, that those are just some examples of the work that we have to do uh, with our administrators. It's not just a revisions and then we're off and running. There's a lot of training because the extent to which we train effectively and provide clarity is gonna determine the presence of disparities, I think, because most of the disparities happen in implementation and a lack of understanding. Okay, thank you. Ms. Shaw. Here we are, thank you. Um, so um, in regards to the defiance and disrespect um, recommendation, why is this um, only for staff? And so if this all these behaviors occurred student to student, it would be a level two violation or? Correct, so okay. currently it sits at a level two violation. Um, when Folks weighed in on defiance and disrespect um, through surveys, the emails, and the community forums. What surfaced was their concern amongst student behavior with staff members. Um, there wasn't an ask for any majority or overall with stakeholders that the defiance and disrespect amongst peers change from a level two. So um, this is why it would just involve staff. So when you'll see the red line revisions, you'll see a defiance and disrespect piece, and it'll sit just as it does now with the same language for students in your level two. And then you'll see the recommended revision of this sitting in level three. So that that's the reason why this is moved a level and for peers is not, is the voices that we heard from stakeholders um, were not concerned about that piece peer-to-peer -peer moving levels. That's the only reason. Um, and I, I, I was very deliberate in the survey question and then when I met with staff members, because I also met with a great number of schools throughout every region, and that piece in part, and I said, are you, so level two amongst peers is something you're, you're still feeling okay about? And people would say, yes, mm -hmm. I said, so where is the issue? with the defiance and disrespect, because it always came up. We need to talk about defiance and disrespect. They said it's what involves staff. And so when we went through all of our notes, and I always had someone from my department there at every school site, every community forum, all of our surveys, this is what surfaced from it, that's why. Thank you, and and then has did you see anything as far as like uh, abeyance contracts, and like I see sometimes uh, students will have multiple uses of the abeyance contracts. Um, was there any feedback about abeyance contracts and maybe like stopping to use an abeyance contract if it's not uh, working well with that student? Um, yes, actually I'm glad you brought up abeyance contract pieces and parts. There is one more education needed and be more clarity within the policy. And so um, 
I've actually been working um, with Mr. Ross and his team, and as I joked with him, I said, I'm gonna get really good at these PIAs because we are looking at the policies and the language that touches abeyance contracts specifically and a few other pieces and parts. We're not going to put this with the revision for the code of conduct process, but you're absolutely right in tune with where our department's at um, in terms of looking at that as well and all the alternative education options because um, yes, we do need some more uh, clarity and pieces and parts in use of that and that does sit in policy, okay. not in, not in the code of conduct piece. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. Yes. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the substance abuse class. Um, mm -hmm. We know it's not effective. Mm -hmm. What are we, um, what has the community suggested, the staff suggested, and like, what, what are we gonna do in the code of conduct? Well, I, I will say that there's been a lot of voices that it's not working. And so now the task is what do we need to do to get this ball rolling? I will tell you um, that I've already met with Julie Shivananda and her team with our SEL department and Angela, who is in charge of those drug awareness classes. Um, so just so you know, that feedback has been given right away. Hey, however this code of conduct revision process shakes itself out, no matter what happens, we have to look at this and we have to work together. And uh, Julie Shivananda and I work really well together and I'm, I'm confident that um, as we bring other folks into the discussion, we are gonna be able to have a more robust system because it was really heartbreaking, the feedback from kids. They said, please help us. We are watching our friends become addicted to drugs and you offer a class and that isn't helping and that's real. I mean, that's no stakeholder is gonna say otherwise. And so that is something we absolutely will support our SEL department in that space. Go ahead, Dr. Trujillo. <clears throat> Probably what we're going to have to invest in is sort of an outside curriculum. When I worked for Phoenix Union, we didn't have internal staff uh, facilitate the drug awareness programming. It was a series of actually eight classes, not one. Mm -hmm. And we actually had an outside organization come in, and it was a standardized curriculum, uh, professional social workers. They had a contract for the district. I think if we're going to be effective in this vein, we probably do have to move in that direction. I've since kind of revisited our initial uh, thought that our counselors and our in-house social workers, they have the talent, they have the passion, they have the expertise, and they have the relationships to do these programs. But what I didn't take into consideration is their workload, and they're feeling it. And they're overworked, they have high caseloads, um, and we have put this program responsibility on them and just even having them do one class is a lot for them. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to come to the realization that it's not our in-house talent, it's their work capacity right now with all the shortages that we have for social workers and counselors that we probably would do best maybe looking at one, an outside organization to really do the drug awareness and chemical dependency programming with fidelity uh, and actually bring in a more structured program. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, and thank you everyone on the governing board for some great questions. And Ms. Ryan, thank you for your, for your presentation this evening. I always enjoy presenting with all of you. The first time I was nervous, but I, I actually get excited because I love, I, I love this work. This is why I wanted this exact position is to be able to do this for our kids. So thank you so much. I'll be remote on the 6th because we're in DC. Just give a shout out representing the Wakefield Knights at the National Geography Bee. My sons will be competing on behalf of Tucson Unified. So I'll be zooming in from DC. I'll see you on the 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the governing board members, I'm going to recommend a recommend, uh, some ingest, agenda adjustments since we're getting close to 9 o'clock. I'm going to recommend that we do 7.1 to 7.5 next, then go, uh, which is all of our uh, appointments and then go to our consent calendar. And then after we approved uh, what has not been moved from the consent calendar, uh, take a break so that we can celebrate and have some photos and then do the rest of the consent calendar and move on to the rest of the agenda. Any objections? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to item 7.1, administrative appointments. Uh, Executive Director of Technology Services. All right, President Shaw, members of the governing board. Uh, tonight, uh, we begin a series of, of administrative recommendations starting with our recommendation for the Executive Director for Technology Services. Uh, tonight, uh, we're proud to recommend one of the foremost 
uh, network infrastructure experts in Pima County. He's, we've been blessed to have him with us here uh, in TUSD for the better part of 20 years. He currently serves as the Interim executive, ex executive Director for Information Technology Services, but prior to that, for a decade, for 10 years, he was our Director for Network uh, Infrastructure inside of Information Technology Services. I often say that um, Mr. Hamade isn't just familiar with the IT house. He actually is one of its architects and he helped build it uh, over the last 10 years in his previous job. He also previously served as a manager of our field techs out in the field. He's intimately familiar with the field tech experience on the ground, uh, supporting those employees as they work with our schools. So tonight, uh, we are proud to recommend Mr. Robbie Hamade to serve as the uh, um, Executive Director for Information Technology Services. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Well, don't, don't clap yet. We haven't approved it yet. <laughs> uh, governing board members, is there a motion or? <laughs> so moved. I'll second. Moved by Ms. Axtrom, and seconded by Ms. Luna Rose. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Item passes 5 0. Congratulations, Mr. Hamaday. <laughs> And um, now we move on to the uh, amazing Hollinger community. Uh, we are proud tonight to recommend uh, probably one of the most distinguished uh, school principals uh, in Southern Arizona. Uh, he comes to us from the Santa Cruz Unified School District uh, where he has been serving for a number of years. And his distinguished service has led him to the tremendous honor of being named the Administrator of the Year, the Principal of the Year for the Arizona uh, School Administrators Association. Uh, he has served uh, proudly as a principal, all right, for the better part of uh, 10 years with 15 years of administrative experience. And um, Santa Cruz Unified School District is uh, renowned for its excellence. And there he, uh, he currently serves as um, the principal of uh, Mountain View Elementary School, where that school has been distinguished uh, academically under his leadership. Prior to that, he was a principal out in uh, beautiful Calabasas, out there uh, in uh, Southern California. Well, tonight, we would like to recommend uh, for the principal position of Hollinger, Mr. Christopher Jackson. Great, thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Um, we were remiss in giving Mr. Hamade a chance to speak. We'll do that in a moment. Uh, but any uh, leading from the board on this candidacy? All right, I'll move the item. I'll second. All right, item moved by myself and seconded by Ms. Luna Rose. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Item passes 5-0. Congratulations, Mr. Jackson. Aye. Okay, if we can have uh, Mr. Hamade say a few words and then Mr. Jackson, if you would like to say a few words and then we're back on track. I just want to say thank you very much, Governing Board, President Shaw, Dr. Trujillo, everybody. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, but with your help and support, uh, you'll make the job easy on us. So thank you very much. Is Mr. Jackson here? Yes. Good evening, President Shaw, members of the board. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, thank you for having me uh, this evening. Uh, you know, where I'm at currently is a special place. It's hard to leave those kids in that community, but Tucson's a special place. I'm from Tucson. I'm a Tucson native. I'm actually a fifth generation Tucsonan. Uh, my grandparents went to school at Ross Rouge and Tucson High. I went to Sam Hughes, Mansfeld, Tucson High. My father went to Palo Verde, my mother went to Catalina. Uh, we've all participated in athletics and clubs and art, art productions through the years. Uh, so being able to um, finally come back and serve Tucson uh, and specifically the Hollinger community um, will not just be a job for me, it's, it's something that I'm looking forward to and excited about because it's uh, where I'm from. So I'm looking forward to getting started and I thank everyone for that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. 
And our next neighborhood, our, our next uh, recommendation is actually my, my neighborhood school, my, my corner of the district where I live is a beautiful Morgan Maxwell K-8. And tonight's recommendation brings 15 years of administrative experience. Began her teaching career out in Sunnyside, did a little bit of teaching for Flowing Wells, and then put together a very distinguished career in Sawarita, where she was a proud assistant principal of Anza Trail K-8, that later became principal of Sawarita Middle School, and uh, made the move to TUSD about a year ago to serve as the interim principal at Morgan Maxwell. Uh, she has uh, impressed that community with her passion, her commitment, and her dedication uh, to be the best leader that she can be for kids and community. So tonight, we want to recommend uh, Ms. Larissa Nido to serve as the principal of Morgan Maxwell K-8. President Shaw. Is that Ms. Ekstrom? I would like to motion to approve Ms. Gladys Sanido to serve as the principal of Morgan Maxwell K through eight school. I'll second. All right, item moved by Ms. Ekstrom and seconded by Ms. Luna Rose. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Congratulations, Ms. Nido. And uh, uh, I will say that Ms. Nido is missing for a very good reason tonight. It is eighth grade promotion night at Morgan Maxwell. So I know she's excited uh, for this recommendation. Great. Our next uh, uh, recommendation is for the uh, principalship of uh, Sewell. And tonight we would like to recommend one of our most experienced and veteran assistant principals uh, who's done some incredibly impressive work uh, at Dietz K-8, where she currently serves as the assistant principal, and she's been there since 2018, and has done a remarkable job uh, with the leadership, uh, with a really, really nice academic bounce back for the Dietz K-8 community. Prior to that, she served as assistant principal at Booth Fickett uh, from 2015 to 2018, and worked with teachers prior to that in the district as a learning support coordinator. So tonight, for the principalship of uh, Sewell Elementary, we would like to recommend Ms. Eileen Gao. Dr. Shaw. Ms. Luna Rose. I'd like to approve the um, position of principal at Sewell Elementary to, for Ms. Eileen Gao. Second. All right, item moved by Ms. Luna Rose, seconded by Ms. Ekstrom. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Item passes 5 0. Ms. Gao, congratulations. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Shaw, Governing Board members, Dr. Trujillo, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'd like to thank the community members from Sewell that have been sitting here all evening and sitting <laughs> and being part of this process. I really look forward to serving the Sewell community and getting to know the community better. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And Ms. Dr. Shaw. Yes, Ms. Luna Rose. I just want to um, point of personal privilege really quick. Miss Bonnie Moore, I just want to say hello. I see you and I've been seeing you in the corner. Um, she's a wonderful community rep for Sewell Elementary, a school near and dear to my heart. So thank you for the community members to be here. Great. Thank you, Miss Luna Rose, as a former parent of a Sewell daughter. Mr. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, our last and uh, not least. Last but not least, uh, we have an interim principal recommendation for Banks Elementary, the beautiful Banks community out in the beautiful Southwest uh, area of our district. Uh, tonight, we wanna recommend uh, one of our talented administrative leaders. He currently serves as the assistant principal of uh, Gridley Middle School, but uh, has a heart for working with our Native American community. That can be seen in his impressive record, working in cells as a principal of uh, Indian Oasis Elementary or serving as principal of the uh, San Javier Mission School. Uh, all working over at the Hassan Education Center, also in service to the Tana Otham community, or serving as a Head Start program director for the Pasquayaki community. Uh, he, uh, we're proud to have him here at TUSD, and uh, we'd like to recommend Mr. William Rosenberg to serve as the interim principal of Banks uh, Elementary for the 23-24 school year. Dr. Shaw? Ms. Shaw. I'd like to move this item. Second. Item moved by Ms. Shaw, seconded by Ms. Ekstrom. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Item passes 5-0. Mr. Rosenberg, congratulations. Aye. 
Dr. Shaw, uh, honorable board members, Dr. Trujillo, thank you for the opportunity to be a principal in TUSD. Really looking forward to learning more and more about the community in Banks, uh, Banks Elementary School. I am going to miss uh, the time I had at Gridley, though, and all the staff and the parents and the kids there, too. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite a transition, but I'm looking forward to doing all I can there. Thank you for uh, the support. Dr. Fuyu, that brings us to our consent agenda. Yes, President Shaw, members of the governing board, I'd like to recommend for your consideration of approval the consent agenda as arranged, item 6.2 through 6.21. Governing board members, any clarification or anything that we need to pull? So moved. Mr. Mr. Romero. Um, I would like to uh, pull 6.17 for um, uh, clarification on some things on there. All right. Anything else, governing board members? So we have items, oh. Ms. Shaw. Can we pull 618 as well? Okay. So before us, we have a consent agenda, a consent agenda item 6.2 through 6.16, 6 6.19 through 6.21. I'll make a motion to approve that. I'll second. Item of uh, motion by myself and seconded by Ms. Ekstrom. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, any opposition, or abstention rather. Item passes 5-0. And I want to congratulate um, 11 amazing assistant principal candidates that we approved through the consent agenda. Uh, starting with Ivan Torres, permanent assistant principal at Grajava Elementary School. James Marino, uh, assistant principal for Booth Thicket. Michelle Weisbrod, uh, assistant principal for Borman. Uh, Siobhan Danielle, Assistant Principal for Pister. Jennifer Meyerson, Assistant Principal for Pueblo High School. Carolyn Jones, Assistant Principal for Rincon High School. Uh, Murray Lewis, Assistant Principal for Roberts Naylor K-8. Mario Gastelum, Assistant Principal for Sabino High School. Calista Redolph, Assistant Principal for Saguaro. Luis uh, Joseph, Assistant Principal for Santa Rita. Omar Sotelo, Assistant Principal for Valencia middle school. So congratulations for all these amazing 11 assistant principals. If uh, we could ask all of our new administrative leaders, our recently appointed assistant principals and our principals and our executive director for IT to kind of gather up here in the open space for a picture with, from our media team, that would be greatly appreciated. And we'll be with Tessa meeting for five-ish meetings. Five-ish meetings, excuse me. <laughs> five-ish minutes. Five-ish meetings. Five -ish meetings.
And I'm going to ask all the revelers to take the revelry uh, outside. Where's his gavel? <laughs> Congratulations to everyone. We have, I think, 16 or 17 amazing new leaders for our district, so congratulations. And we're going to go on to item 6.17, approval of sole source purchase designations for fiscal year 24. And I see we have Ms. Kerfoot coming to the dais, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Romero for any questions he had when he um, pulled his item. All right, so looking at uh, the thing that was attached to our um, agenda, talks about fiscal 2023-2024 sole source designations. The first one on there is SunTran. Correct. Uh, right, you know, and it has it at $800,000. Correct. Um, I know right now they're still doing free um, bus rides for TUSD. Um, they started doing free bus rides uh, since uh, March of 2020. Correct. Um, so in 2020, 2021, and then 2021, 2022, did we pay for these uh, this this fee in those other years when uh, all the bus rides are free? At, or um, President Shaw, governing board members, Dr. Trujillo, Council Ross. Um, actually, we did not. I had spoken to Martha Zamora, the director of transportation. Um, about two weeks ago when I was working on this list and asked them specifically about SunTran as it was something that the city had received ESSER funds much like we did. I'm not sure they were called ESSER, but it was federal funding that they received due to COVID and they are covering those passes. I asked her because originally the amount we were spending pre-COVID was about a million a year and she asked me to put the figure down at 800,000 just as an estimated spend, but that she's working with the city to find out if those funds are going to be available past in, into next fiscal year. And she's hoping that it will at least cover um, the first six months, um, but she hasn't heard yet. So the estimated spend is what we think we might spend, but not necessarily anything that we're committed to spending but it's, we bring this to you saying, this is a sole source. We purchase these bus passes through SunTran as they're the only one in town that can sell us those bus passes. Yeah, I understand that they're the only one. I just wanted to confirm that during the bus free bus rides, TUSD did not right. pay any money to SunTran, the city right. of Tucson no, for SunTran. No, we did not, no, no. And we're still currently not paying for bus passes if the students are using them. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that, that was, we were just paying money for them for services that were free. Correct. Ms. Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Romero, for the question, because I was thinking about this a while ago, because <laughs> I remember this also being on an agenda that we paid in the past. And so what, it, does any of the uh, governing board members who were serving in the last couple of years recall such a thing because I do remember it and it may be agenda. that on our list we do put that designation down uh -huh. just to let you know that the contract that we have with them is a sole source but the, uh, but again the amount it we may have had that amount in there but we can show we did not spend anything with them okay. for that and actually okay. this year we have not I think they have a purchase order in but I checked and they don't have any spend against it Please correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're trying to get it in shot. Is that so? We, every year we budget for this, and right. we can't assume that the city is going to continue having the service for free. Right. And so we not use all of the budgeted money if the services continue to be free. Right. Correct. Right. And so what we're doing is approving this up to eight hundred thousand dollars as part of potential spend yeah. if and, the services are not free. And it is included in transportation's budget that you guys have seen the the draft budget, but then you'll vote on that in the next couple of weeks. Okay, and so that 800000 um, estimate is reflective of the actual costs for the students that we estimate use that. And like some of the, because I know they have like a sliding scale when they used to be fee-based, um, like lower income folks could pay less. And so right. do we have like a discounted rate? Um, as far as I know, we do. I mean, Martha, the director of transportation, would know for sure. I just asked her what amount would she like me to put what would she think? Because it did say a million, you know, over the past, you know, before COVID and, and probably last year we had that amount. And she just asked me to change it to 800,000 and, and said she's still working with the city and hopefully they're gonna have those funds that we won't be able to pay 
at least into next fiscal year, if not all of next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Romero? And um, so the money that wasn't spent over those other years, do we know where, I know it was budgeted here, did it go somewhere else or did it just still kind of sit in this little budget area? Um, I was gonna say, I'm gonna turn to Ricky. Ricky might be able to speak to where those funds <laughs> So the $800,000 that's part of this, if it's reallocated within the actual budget. So for last fiscal year, for example, we did budget the $800,000. Those were reallocated specifically to fund the salaries, the increases that were funded back in November, reappropriated those in the salary line item. They were used for that purpose. There is this 800,000 line item again, because my understanding is the city of Tucson's free Suntran will end by December at this point. Thanks. So I will move this item. Second. Item is moved by myself and seconded by Ms. Ekstrom. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed or abstentions, item passes 5 0. We'll move on to item 6.18 approval of the TUSD and cooperative contracts for online supplemental curriculum materials for fiscal year 23 24. Ms. Shaw, you pulled the item? Yes, thank you. Um, just have a couple questions. So overlooking the, um, the PowerPoint that was attached to this agenda item, um, I, I which maybe the fifth uh, slide um, it says that uh, you know the for the platforms for the 23-24 uh, school year um, it says elimination of over 50 percent of platforms and so our platforms already eliminated the, so what we're seeing here as far as tier one core tier one supplemental tier two uh, intervention and instructional engagement are the um, platforms already eliminated or are these the ones that we have right now that we're paying and potentially we will eliminate 50% of them? So these are the recommendations from the committee um, of platforms that we would like to continue. So they eliminated um, 12 platforms um, and these were the ones that they said are essential. So um, we, in previous slides, I. I don't know which slide it is, but um, slide eight, you see the list of 15 platforms that we were considering, mm -hmm. and um, they eliminated 12 of those. So these, these were what they considered to be essential for teaching and learning. I see, and then I didn't notice a, a slide that kind of listed the usage rates of, you know, the platforms that we're keeping or the platforms that we're um, not uh, getting for the next school year. Um, is that data available or was it just like the, the committee decided because of teacher feedback? What, so, what, go ahead. Yeah, so we do have that data. I, I could provide that to you. We looked at three pieces of data. We sent a survey to all of our teachers asking them what platforms are you using which platforms provide you actionable data? You know, we asked them several questions. So that was our first source of data, just listening to our teachers, having them give us that feedback. The second was actual um, usage data on each of the platforms, um, which really was the major reason for the elimination of the, the platforms that we did eliminate, was they just didn't have enough usage. And then we looked at implementation. So we're using them, are we using them effectively. And one of the things, and you see different quotes from teachers in there on the committee, was that they really felt like part of the issue with usage and effective usage was we had so many. And so as a teacher, it was hard to really learn different platforms and use them well um, because they had so many options. And as a district, it was hard to support that many platforms. Um, so this reduction in platforms, identification of this is a platform identified for this use, like tier core one instruction, um, will really help um, teachers in the district implement them more effectively. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll move the item. I'll second. second. Item moved by myself and seconded by Ms. Luna Rose. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Item passes 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to a very, another very consequential item on tonight's agenda. And this is here for action of 
approve memorandum of agreements, compensation for TEA consensus, TEA white collar and food service, non-bargaining, Eli, AFSCME, and CWA. Dr. Trujillo. Uh, President Shaw, members of the board, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Maricela Mesa, our director for employee relations. But I also want to thank our TEA president and her leadership team. They've been partners, uh, as they are every year, in the compensation and salary negotiations. Uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Mesa to uh, go over tonight's proposal. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, President Shaw, Board Clerk Romero, Governing Board members. I present to you today the package for increases for the 2023-24 school year. Um, we have signed agreements with all employee groups, AFSCME, CWA, ELI, TEA White Collar, and TEA Consensus. I want to say um, thank you. Uh, I want to echo Dr. Trujillo's words to um, President Cheney and Audrey Keneally, who uh, led the TA negotiation team, uh, Stacy Gist, who led with Eli, Michael Burrell, and Cindy Graybill with AFSCME, and Linda Hatfield with CWA. The proposed increases would go in effect on July 1, and um, everything I'm going to present today. Um, while it'll go in effect, uh, we want the board to know that we have also agreed that we plan to return in fall of 2023 and um, once the 40th day is reconciled and reopen negotiations at that time. So let's talk about the increases we're going to look at for next year. I'll start with the consensus agreement. For TDRA, which are your teachers, counselors, they are going to see a total increase of $1,500. It'll be in one step of $500 and $1,000 added to the supplemental base, which um, comes from classroom site fund. For TDRB, which would be teacher mentors, curriculum service provi providers, they'll have a match increase of the $1,500. OTPT SLP, they're going to see a one step increase and also 1% added to the salary schedule. And also um, to note that for some of these uh, salary schedules, we've added and changed some positions. For example, to this uh, salary schedule, we've added the audiologist and a behavior certified behavior, board certified behavior analyst. All the uh, position salary schedules and extra duty schedules will be are noted in the attachments that will be uploaded and are included with um, the attachments with the MOA. Now, traditionally in consensus, we've had three salary schedules. We've had TDRA, TTRB, and OTPT SLP. Well, now we are going to be adding two new salary schedules. So, so more to, to get used to here. The first one is going to be nurses, social workers uh, salary schedule and then we're going to have a separate salary schedule for exceptional education teachers. This is new for us and we're gonna get into it a, a little bit more right now. As far as nurses and social workers, nurses are going to see an increase of approximately five to $6,000. It'll be approximately $4,800 added to the salary schedule with a 2% increase that um, everyone will be receiving. The current schedule also reflects a 7.5 hour day. And if it were, if they were to change to an eight hour day, the schedule would be changed accordingly. Social workers are also included on the salary schedule, but their uh, compensation was agreed to in um, May 2022. And it was one of those, we came in May 2022 and they, were, they realized the increase for this last school year, but it wasn't memorialized in the consensus salary schedule. So the social worker increase is not new, but they will be receiving the 2% that um, um, others are going to be receiving. So now we're gonna talk about exceptional education and we're likely gonna have a lot of questions about these, but it's also a, a very exciting time for the district. Our exceptional education teachers are going to still receive the $1,500 that um, was afforded for the TDRA salary schedule. For itinerant resource teachers and the um, um, classifications listed above, 
they will receive an additional $4,000 applied to their salary schedule. For self-contained exceptional education teachers, they're going to have an additional $10,000 added to their salary schedule. So what does this mean? If you're a resource teacher, itinerant teacher, you are going to see a $5,500 increase for next year, taking into consideration the, the $1,500 that went to TDRA plus the 4,000. For our self-contained teachers, it will be $11,500 that they will see in increases next year. Additionally, uh, they will continue to receive the same benefits that are afforded a TDRA with the classroom site fund, um, in particular supplemental base and uh, performance pay. And we listed the positions that um, benefit from this in um, as above and also in the attachments to the MOAs. For our bargaining group, um, as you remember, we were here, um, seems like just a few months ago, but in fall of 2022, at that time, the board uh, addressed a minimum wage increase, compression increases, a lot of work is done at that time, and now we're back again. And we're gonna add another, essentially 2% to the salaries um, associated with AFSCME, CWA, ELI, TEA, White Collar Food Service, and non-bargaining. It'll be in a one-step increase with 1% added to the salary schedule. If you hit the maximum amount of steps, you'll still receive a 2% increase. So you'll still read, um, receive the equivalent of. Um, when we come forward with the Eli White Collar Food Service and non-bargaining agreements at the next board meeting or the June 13th board meeting, we will include the salary schedules there. Um, Ask me and CWA, they have two-year agreements, but we will still update their salary schedule in the um, online that's in the, uh, um, that's online currently. The above increases are in addition to what was agreed to in fall 2022, where we address compression, and also as a reminder, um, our employees are gonna be receiving the $2,500 retention stipend that'll take place December 1st, and uh, um, that was a previously a board approved, previously board approved action. And again, um, I would be remiss if I didn't Say again that we are going to reopen negotiations in fall 2023. Uh, the bargaining groups wanted um, to ensure that that was stressed. The graph above provides the funding considerations for you to look at. Um, I know this has been presented before, but if you have any questions, we're available for questions. What you'll see is the total cost of increases come to about 8.9 million. Um, when we're looking at exceptional education, I want to focus on that block right there. The 2.1 million increase, which um, has to do with the resource and itinerant increase of $4,000 and then the $10,000 for self-contained, that will co be coming out of the I IDEA funding, uh, a separate source of dollars. For the $4,000 for preschool exceptional education teachers, that will be coming out of classroom site fund, out of the menu option, what we've traditionally called as the menu option. Lastly, this was a group project, okay? A lot of people contributed to getting here. I think to the leaders already, I wanna thank AFSCME, CWA, ELI, TEA, I have to give special note to, to the TEA, TUSD, Exceptional Education Committee. Um, we have some strong leaders in there, Sue Essington from TEA and Dr. Salmon representing exceptional education and a wonderful group of folks. I want to thank district leadership and a lot of work was done by also finance, human resources, and the employee relations staff. With that, we ask uh, that you approve the compensation increase package for next school year. Thank you, Ms. Mesa. Governing board, any comments, feedback, or questions before we ask for a motion? Ms. Luna Rose? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mesa. I just wanted to make a comment, quick comment about <clears throat> the exceptional ed. I'm, I'm pleased that uh, with that package being brought forth, I think it's, um, 
it's well uh, beyond time, and so thank you so much for your work, and to, to EA for the work, and Ms. Cheney, we're gonna miss you, so, um, but thank you. And Audrey, and I hope your leg's feeling better. <laughs> so, um, but I'd like to move the item. I'll second. All right, item moved by Ms. Luna Rose and seconded by Ms. Ekstrom. Uh, I'll just add, you know, I, I wish we could do more, and I hope that we could do more uh, in the future. Uh, I really appreciate the work that you've done, Ms. Mesa, with our bargaining units and all the work our bargaining units. And I think, I think you know, a lot of the changes, you know, having the separate salary schedule for the nurses, the work we've done on social workers, the work we're doing in exceptional education, you know, we're at the schools. You know, I, I still remember just a few weeks ago, a principal crying because how frustrated she was with what was going on with exceptional education and filling classroom positions and... Uh, and, and managing students, um, you know, with the staff that, that she wanted to keep, and you know, we're listening. Uh, I know our leadership is listening. Our bargaining unit leadership um, are listening to all the frustrations and needs uh, on health and safety, and and working with some of our most uh, high need students um, that really need the supports that we have. And I hope uh, that this tonight will move the needle and make a difference in recruiting and retaining the best and brightest that we know our students and our district deserve. And all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Item passes 5-0. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Trio, with item 7.7, .7, recommendation of appointment of two new members to serve on the Tucson Unified School District Audit Committee. Yes, um, we've got um, two new members of the audit committee uh, that will be uh, recommended uh, this evening. I don't know if we have any audit committee members here. We don't. We have our so um, <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Romero, if you want to do the honors uh, in uh, recommending our two uh, committee members. I wasn't ready. You got to pull it up real quick. All right, so we had uh, two um, uh, recommendations. Uh, the first gentleman was Raymond Kavanaugh, and the second was Kevin Oberg. Do I read about them? Or? Thank you, Mr. Romero. Those CVs are in our executive content for this evening. Any questions, feedback, or comments? Mr. Romero, you want to do the honors of the, the motion? <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to add these onto the audit committee, please. I'll, I'll second, second that motion. I'll let Dr. Shaw second. <laughs> Item is moved by Mr. Romero, seconded by myself. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstention? Item passes 5 0. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh, and Mr. Oberg, for uh, volunteering your service to our district audit committee. Next, Tria, we have uh, item 8.1. Motion yeah. to approve uh, the third Friday of June as Juneteenth. Yes, uh, President Shaw, members of the governing board, um, we bring this item forward at the request of uh, board member Sadie Shaw. I will turn it over to her uh, to make the uh, formal recommendation. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo, uh, President Shaw, governing board. Uh, this item is very close to my heart. I. I've been attending the Juneteenth Festival um, in town since I was a child over at Kennedy Park. Um, and now I'm proud to serve on the Tucson Juneteenth uh, Board of Directors. And so some of you may know that this item came before the board uh, last year, November 29th, I believe it was, um, for us to acknowledge the day, um, simply just to acknowledge it. And, you know, I said, wait a minute let's follow the local and national standard and make it a paid holiday. Um, unfortunately, uh, the previous board did not second my motion, so it um, failed. But, you know, we have an opportunity now to follow this national and local standard and um, make it a paid holiday. And I, I know that, you know, uh, as it's presented, uh, this paid holiday would only benefit the summer employees, 
however, I think it's still meaningful for those of uh, our employees who decide to work over the summer. Um, it's not the only federal holiday that lands in the summer. There's July 4th, so that's interesting. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think it would behoove us to uh, to to simply um, acknowledge it, to go a bit further also, and um, offer it as a paid holiday to our hardworking employees. And so, um, yeah. I would like to move this item to pay um, all of our summer employees, um, give them that Friday, which is already off, um, but we decided on the Friday before Juneteenth, I believe it's the 16th, because one, we already have an established summer school calendar, um, and we did not want to extend, or we really, I mean, it would be logistically very tough to extend it by one day. Um, and actually, uh, Pima County and the city of Tucson, they they don't, um, I believe they don't designate that Juneteenth day, June 19th, they, they offer it as like, one of them does like any day in June, and then the other, I, I'm not sure what they do, but uh, I don't think any of them fall on the actual day of Juneteenth. I think Dr. Trujillo, you told me that you could give us more information if it's relevant. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm requesting that Juneteenth be honored on Friday the 16th um, and that we pay all of our employees who are working during the summer. Any questions? I'd like to move the item. I'll second, but I have a question. So okay. are we looking for um, paying the filled summer positions, the one day cost approximately $450,000? Is that what we're approving? I, I'm not sure if we have an approximate rate because there still may be some vacancies that are filled, but currently filled summer positions, the one day cost would be approximately $450,000. Mr. Hernandez? Mr. Hernandez? So, so the, the cost for the, so we currently have about 7,000 open summer work positions, right? These are individuals who, you know, who don't work in the month of June or July and we provide them temporary jobs or they are summer school teachers or summer school staff. About 50% of them are currently filled. That is the approximate $400,000 price tag that you see. If we filled all 7,000 jobs, it could go upwards of $900,000. That's the cost of the one day. And that's assuming a six hour schedule. Everybody has a variable schedule. So that 900 is based on an estimate thinking six hour day. But if people work more, people work less, depending on what they're hired for, that number could certainly fluctuate. The only one we know for a fact is standard is the $300,000 number for the 12 month employees. The people, the 1700, 1700 positions that we currently have that work through the month of June and July and are compensated for all 261 uh, work days of the contract day. So the, the number varies anywhere between 300 and $1.2 million, depending on what the governing board would like to do. And that's the direction that the staff would need in order for us to move forward with, with Ms. Shaw's recommendation. So we have a motion on the table to approve the third Friday uh, of June as a governing board recognized Juneteenth. Uh, and we have a second for that. And I'll make an amendment to the motion to have this paid for those who are contracted to work on that day. I'll second that. Okay, paid. so we have an amendment and a second. Okay, so that means that your amendment gets voted first, is that correct? Correct. Okay, if I, if I may discuss. Yes, please, Ms. Shah. Yes, thank you. Um, so, you know, what, we have a week after the, the 16th, a week or two, that those employees would be working. So um, to cherry pick the very tiny amount of employees to benefit from this holiday, I think is a disservice to our community. Um, it, it simply is. And um, I, I just, why, why Dr. Ravi? Because it costs about $1.2 million potentially. And I think um, there's a lot we can do with $1.2 million. Um, and especially when we go back to negotiations this fall and look at other ways um, that our, our school district really needs those funds. And 
Um, we were limited of funds. We don't have unlimited funds to spend. And so I think trying to limit this to about 300,000 um, is something that I think is more appropriate for us as the fiduciary responsibility of our district to be able to approve tonight. Right, understood. Um, I think the $1.2 million price tag is rather misleading. Uh, we're not gonna fill those 3,000 vacancies in the next couple weeks. Uh, do you agree with that? that? So that number was taken about two weeks ago. Um, I don't know how many of those positions are currently filled. I know that most of those positions are outside in operations. I know most of our summer school positions are filled. Um, but if we took the actual number that was filled plus the you know the amount of people that we have currently, we're talking roughly about seven to eight hundred thousand um, dollars that are currently paid for with ESSER funds, right? So our summer school is paid for with ESSER funds this year, next school year, and then that's it. And so whatever source of funding that is identified, whether it's tuition charges to parents or whether it's another source of funding, that source of funding would have to pick up that added cost plus any potential increases in the hourly rates that we pay for the individuals. So that's the one item that we can't plan for at this point because we don't know what the rates of pay will be 12 to 24 months from now. Right. Mr. Romero. Um, my concern on this is the financial implications, you know, the cost that this is going to, to cost the district, um, just being financial responsible um, and, and yeah, I understand uh, the need for the day and, you know, I'm good to, I don't even, um, if you did it as an observed holiday, but my hesitation would be the financial implications on that moving forward this every year, you know, um, we're, we seem like we're finding ourselves in financial binds uh, uh, on, on, a, on a every other week uh, type of basis on, on something uh, as far as that goes. Um, so my hesitation would not be for the holiday, it would be for the uh, paying of it as a holiday. And what, Mr. Romero, do you feel about this compromise amendment? I don't think the uh, amendment is really going to help the people that I think Sadie, remember Michelle was looking to help, help out on that one because it's the 12 uh, month people. Um, you know, they're going to appreciate it, but I, I don't think it's having it as a paid holiday is really helping some of the other teachers and other staff that would better benefit, I think, from, from a paid holiday. I agree. Uh, you know, I'd rather do my motion than, than the t tiny minuscule amount of employees who may be working on that Friday. Um, Mr. Hernandez, so we have other paid federal holidays. Give me an estimate on how much we pay for another federal holiday, like Martin Luther King Day. Uh, what are the other ones? Uh, I, I couldn't 4th. tell you off the top of my head what that would run um, for the various federal holidays. Um, they are certainly variable because if we talk specifically about the federal holidays, I mean, there are individuals who get access to those holidays that are paid. Um, fall breaks and spring breaks are not applied equally to everybody. We do have certain uh, employees based on their employee agreements that are not necessarily paid for the full five days of the fall break or the spring break. So that number is variable, but I mean, we can get you that number. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what the, what the daily cost is for the holiday. Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, the administration, we, we just weigh in um, from a third perspective. Uh, we're we take your direction, okay? We're not here to weigh in on um, the need to add the additional holiday or the validity of the, of the holiday. The holiday is great. It's a celebration of, of African-American culture and, and certainly would be a welcome addition to the calendar. We're always looking at things administratively like consistency and precedence. So for example, um, a governing board paid holiday right now means compensating individuals that are actually contracted to work on the holiday that the day falls on. Let's take 4th of July. Let's take Memorial Day. 4th of July, we compensate 12-month individuals or those that are actually working on that day. We don't go take the nine-month employees who don't have that day as part of their contract and pay them for a holiday that doesn't occur during their work contract. If we compensate the employees um, for summer school, which, which the sentiment is great and I wish we could do more for, uh, obviously all of our, our uh, employees that choose to work in the summer. 
we're going to be setting a precedent of paying off contract employees for a holiday that doesn't occur during their contracted work assignment. Um, the summer school schedule, the summer school calendar, it, it's too close to add that additional day. That was our intention, was to not, as board member Shaw said, was to not disrupt the summer school calendar. We know that families have already planned trips. We know that staff members have planned trips. We didn't wanna add that additional day beyond the week of June 28th to make it up. So this was a way to get the observance done. And that's our, that's our only uh, observation for the board is the precedence that it would set a potential expectation that off-contract employees would then want compensation for these holidays that occur when they're not actually um, on a work contract for us. Uh, so that's just something that the board, you know, what we should take into consideration as well, in addition to the cost as, as other board members have noted. Dr. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. I think we could be pretty explicit with this direction if we say all workers contracted in the month of June. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so that, as Dr. Trujillo said, we're not opening up a can of worms for all these paid holidays that many people aren't benefiting from. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a slew of holidays that we pay people for Labor Day, is that during the school year? It must be, right? Okay, and that must be over a million dollars. And so are we gonna go nitpick each federal holiday because of like a fiscal number that, you know, oh, we're getting close to being in the red, but you know, we have at least 10 that I'm looking at right here. Not all are off. Um, and, and my next point is, We've already allocated the ESSER funds uh, for summer school uh, in the, let me see. In the December 6th meeting, the governing board followed the recommendations of the Budget Advisory Committee to allocate $4.2 million for summer school. And so really, it's already paid for because we allocated it, right? If we allocated that money to summer school, then in theory, it would pay for my motion to pay all employees who are working during summer school. And if, you know, summer school is not something that is gonna always happen, we have to move to make it a thing. And like there's been years where we didn't have it be free for anyone and everyone. And so perhaps next year we won't, allo we won't have summer school. And then if that happens, then with the language that we're passing, no one would get paid, right? Unless they're working during that hour, those. Yeah, if, if the language the 12, is the that it's months. for people who are working during the month of June, whether they're 12 month or right. not, then yeah. yeah, we would follow exactly what you're right. saying. And so if there was no summer school, then that number would be um, dramatically reduced. Yes, theoretically, yes. And so because we have already allocated 4.2 million for summer school, um, I don't see why, you know, we're pinching pennies at this moment. I think my concern is going forward. We are constantly talking about the budget and, and moving forward in, you know, year after year. So having the unknown cost to pay people who work during the month of June, I think that's concerning to me. Where I do believe we need a Juneteenth holiday, it's just... How are we going to pay for it in years to come? So we have a, a motion second. We have an amendment to the motion um, to uh, have the Juneteenth as paid for those who are contracted to work uh, on that day. Uh, Ms. Pena can have a roll call vote. This is for the amendment to the original <coughs> motion only. Ms. Ekstrom? Yes. Ms. Luna Rose? Yes. Mr. Romero? Abstain. Ms. Shaw? No. Dr. Ravi? Yes, item passes three, one with one abstention. Uh, now we go back to the full uh, motion uh, to have Juneteenth, the third Friday of June, be recognized as Juneteenth as amended. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Oh, one aye. moment, one moment. Can we discuss this for a moment? Sure. <laughs> so. So we passed your m amendment, and so now this is just to recognize, acknowledge. 
Right, so we have the original um, motion as amended. So the original motion was the, the motion that's on the board docs to have Juneteenth, and that was amended to be for contracted, uh, for pay for contracted employees. So the, the vote now would be uh, to recognize Juneteenth as uh, the third Friday of June as Juneteenth in TUSD as amended. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Item passes four one or four zero one uh, with one abstention. All right, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Shaw, for bringing this, and uh, and for our leadership for working on this um, recognition of the third Friday of June as Juneteenth. Okay. All right, and so we move over to future meeting dates and agenda items. Dr. Trujillo. Yes. Uh, President Shaw, members of the governing board, very, very busy June. Uh, June 6th is a big study session for the board. Uh, those of you in the community uh, on deck, the governing board will get its formal look at the code of conduct formally redlined with all of the revisions to language, as I mentioned earlier. Those materials we want to make available to the public and the board by June 1st, uh, similar to what we do with first read policy language. We're also going to give the board an opportunity for its uh, first study session on the proposed budget for the district, the MO budget, as well as the proposed desegregation budget before its vote on December 13th. Uh, we will also uh, be looking at some uh, proposed expenditures with the district capital budget inside of curriculum and instruction and facilities. So those are just some of the items you will see at our study session coming up on uh, June 6th. Great, thank you, Dr. Trujillo, and I'll end by congratulating all of our graduates this week. You made us proud, uh, and congratulations, and we're excited about your future journeys ahead. Good night, everyone. <laughs>